Hey everyone, welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel. In this session, we will learn about DevOps testing tools. But before we begin, let me tell you guys that we have daily updates on multiple technologies. If you're a tech geek and a continuous hunt for latest technological trends, then consider getting subscribed to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit that bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. Now, without further ado, let's get started with our agenda for today's session. We will get by understanding Jenkins and the fundamentals of Jenkins. Followed by that, we will understand Selenium and its fundamentals. And finally, we will understand JMeter and its fundamentals. Once we have a brief understanding of these three tools and the fundamentals, then we will have a practical demonstration on all these three tools to have a comfortable understanding of the DevOps testing. With that having said, if you are an aspiring DevOps engineer, and searching for an online training and certification from the experts and the best universities, then search no more. Simply Learn's postgraduate program in DevOps with Caltech University in collaboration with IBM should be your right choice. For more details on this program, please use the link in the description box below. Having said that, over to our training experts for today on the DevOps testing tutorial. Hey there, are you exploring test automation? Are you wondering why everyone is talking about Selenium around you? Do you want to know what Selenium is all about? If yes, this is the video for you. Simply Learn brings to you a very simple tutorial on Selenium. What should you expect from this video? Before you start understanding any automation tool, it's good to look back into what manual testing is all about, what are its challenges, and how automation tool overcomes these challenges. Challenges are always overcome by inventing something new. So let's see how Selenium came into existence and how did it evolve to become one of the most popular web application automation tool. Selenium suite of tools. Selenium is not a single tool. It has multiple components. So we will look into each of them. And as you know, every automation tool has its own advantages and limitations. So we will be looking at what the advantages are and the limitations of Selenium and how do we work around those limitations. Alright, so let's get started. Manual testing. A definition if you can say a manual testing involves the physical execution of test cases against various applications and to do what? To detect bugs and errors in your product. It is one of the primitive methods of testing a software. This was the only method which we knew of earlier. It is execution of test cases without using any automation tools. It does not require the knowledge of a testing tool obviously because everything is done manually. Also, you can practically test any application since you are doing a manual testing. So let's take an example. So say we have a use case. You are testing, say, a Facebook application. And in Facebook application, let's, let's open the Facebook application and say, create an account. This is your web page, which is under test now. Now, as a tester, what would you do? you would write multiple test cases to test each of the functionalities on this page. You will use multiple data sets to test each of these fields like the first name, the surname, mobile number or the new password. And you will also test multiple links. What are the different links on this page? Like say forgotten account or create a new page. So these are the multiple links available on the web pages. Also, you look at each and every element of the web page, like your radio buttons, like your drop down list. Apart from this, you would do an accessibility testing. You would do a performance testing for this page or say a response time after you say click on the login button. Literally, you can do any type of tests manually. Once you have this test cases ready, what do you do? You start executing these test cases one by one. You will find bugs, your developers are going to fix them and you will need to rerun all these test cases one by one again until all the bugs are fixed and your application is ready to ship. Now, if one has to run test cases with hundreds of transactions or the data sets and repeat them, can you imagine the amount of effort required in that? Now, that brings us to the first demerit of the manual testing. Manual testing is a very time consuming process and it is very boring. Also, it is very highly error prone. Why? Because it is done annually and human mistakes are bound to happen. Since it's a manual execution, testers presence is required all the time. One needs to keep doing manual steps, step by step again all the time. He also has to create manual reports group them, format them so that we get good looking reports. Also send these reports manually to all stakeholders. Then collection of logs from various machines where you have run your test, consolidating all of them, creating repositories 
and maintaining them. And again, since it's all is a manual process, there is a high chance of creating manual errors there. Scope of manual testing is limited. For example, let's say regression testing. Ideally, you would want to run all the test cases which you have written. But since it's a manual process, you would not have the luxury of time to execute all of them. And hence, you will pick and choose your test cases to execute. That way, you're limiting the scope of testing. Also, working with large amount of data manually is impractical, which could be the need of your application. What about performance testing? You want to collect metrics on various performance measures as a part of your performance testing. You want to simulate multiple loads on application under test and hence manually performing these kind of tests is not feasible. And to top it all up, say if you're working in an agile model where code is being churned out by developers, testers are building their test and they're executing them as and when the builds are available for testing. And this happens iteratively. And hence, you will need to run this test multiple times during your development cycle. And doing this manually definitely becomes very tedious and boring. And is this an effective way of doing it? Not at all. So what do we do? We automate it. So this tells us why we automate. One, for faster execution. Two, to be less error prone. And three, the main reason is to help frequent execution of our test. So there are many tools available in the market today for automation. One such tool is Selenium. Birth of Selenium. Much before Selenium, there were various tools in the market like say RFT and QTP, just to name a few popular ones. Selenium was introduced by a gentleman called Jason Huggins way back in 2004. He was an engineer at ThoughtWorks and he was working on a web application which needed frequent testing. He realized the inefficiency in manually testing this web application repeatedly. So what he did was he wrote a JavaScript program that automatically controlled the browser actions and he named it as JavaScript Test Runner. Later, he made this open source and this was renamed as the Selenium Core. And this is how Selenium came into existence. And since then, Selenium has become one of the most powerful tool for testing web applications. So how does Selenium help? So we saw all the demerits of manual testing. So we can say by automation of test cases, one, Selenium helps in speedy execution of test cases since manual execution is avoided. The results are more accurate, no human errors. Since your test cases are automated, human resources required to execute automated test cases is far less than manual testing. Because of that, there is a lesser investment in human resources. It saves time and you know time is money. It's cost effective as Selenium is an open source. It is available free of cost. Early time to market. Since you save effort and time on manual execution, your clients will be merrier as you would be able to ship your product pretty fast. Lastly, since your test cases are automated, you can rerun them any point of time and as many times as required. So if this tool offers so many benefits, we definitely want to know more detail about what Selenium is. Selenium enables us to test web applications on all kinds of browsers like Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, Opera, and even the headless browser. Selenium is an open source and it is platform independent. The biggest reason why people are preferring this tool is because it is free of cost. And the QTP and the RFT, which we talked about, are chargeable. Selenium is a set of tools and libraries to facilitate the automation of web application. As I said, it is not a single tool. It has multiple components, which we'll be seeing in detail in some time. And all these tools together help us test the web application. You can run Selenium scripts on any platform. It is platform independent. Why? Because it is primarily developed in JavaScript. It's very common for manual testers not to have in-depth programming knowledge. So Selenium has this record and replay back tool called the Selenium ID, which can be used to create a set of actions as a script and you can replay the script back. However, this is mainly used for demo purposes only because Selenium is such a powerful tool that you should be able to take full advantage of all its features. Selenium provides support for different programming languages like Java, Python, C Sharp, Ruby. So you can write your test scripts in any language you like. One need not know in-depth or advanced knowledge of these languages. Also, Selenium supports different operating systems. It has supports for Windows, Macs, Linux, even Ubuntu as well. So you can run your Selenium test on any platform of your choice. And hence, Selenium is the most popular and widely used automation tools for automating your web applications. Selenium set of tools. So let's go a little more deeper into Selenium. 
As I said, Selenium is not a single tool. It is a suite of tools. So let's look at some of the major components or the tools in Selenium and what they have to offer. So Selenium has four major components. One, Selenium ID. It's the most simplest tool in the suite of Selenium. It is integrated development environment. Earlier, Selenium IDE was available only as a Firefox plugin and it offered a simple record and playback functionality. It is a very simple to use tool, but it's mainly used for prototyping and not used for creating automation in the real time projects because it has its own limitations like any other record and replay tool. Selenium RC. This is nothing but Selenium remote control. It is used to write web application test in different programming language. What it does is, it basically interacts with the browser with the help of something called as RC server. And how it interacts is, it uses a simple HTTP post get request for communication. This was also called as Selenium 1.0 version. But it got deprecated in Selenium 2.0 version and was completely removed in 3.0 and it was replaced by WebDriver. And we will see in detail as why this happened. Selenium WebDriver, this is the most important component in the Selenium suite. It is a programming interface to create and execute text test cases. It is obviously the successor of the Selenium RC which we talked about because of certain drawbacks which RC had. So what WebDriver does is it interacts with the browsers directly unlike RC where the RC required a server to interact with the browser. And the last component is the Selenium Grid. So Selenium Grid is used to run multiple test scripts on multiple machines at the same time. So it helps you in achieving parallel execution. Since the Selenium web driver with you can only do sequential execution, Grid is what comes into picture where you can do your parallel execution. And why is parallel execution important? Because in real time environment, you always have the need to run test cases in a distributed environment. And that is what Grid helps you to achieve. So all this together, helps us to create robust web application test automation. And we will go in detail about each of these components. So before that, let's look at the history of Selenium version. So what did Selenium version comprised of? It had an IDE, RC and GRID. And as I said earlier, there were some disadvantages of using RC. So RC was on its path of deprecation and WebDriver was taking its path. So if you look at Selenium 2 version, it had an earlier version of WebDriver and also the RC. So they coexisted. From 3.0 onwards, RC was completely removed and WebDriver took its place. There is also a 4.0 version around the corner and it has more features and enhancements. Some, some of the features which are talked about are W3C WebDriver standardization, improved ID and improved grid. Now let's look at each of the components in the Selenium suite. Selenium IDE is the most simplest tool in the suite of Selenium. It is nothing but an integrated development environment for creating your automation scripts. It has a record and playback functionality and is a very simple and easy to use tool. It is available as a Firefox plugin and a Chrome extension. So you can use either of this browser to record your test scripts. It's a very simple user interface using which you can create your scripts that interact with your browser. The commands created in the scripts are called Selenese commands and they can be exported to the supported programming language and hence this code can be reused. However, this is mainly used for prototyping and not used for creating automation for your real time projects. Why? Because of its own limitation which any other record and replay tool has. So a bit history of Selenium IDE. So earlier Selenium IDE was only a Firefox extension. So we saw that IDE was available since the Selenium version 1. Selenium ID died with the Firefox version 55. That was ID was stopped supporting from 55 version onwards and this was around 2017 time frame. However, very recently all new brand Selenium ID has been launched by Apply Tools and also they have made it a cross browser. So you can install the extension on Chrome as well as as an add-on on Firefox browser. So they completely revamped this IDE code and now they have made it available on the GitHub under the Apache 2.0 license. And for the demos today, we'll be looking at the new IDE. Now with this new IDE also comes a good amount of features, reusability of test cases, better debugger, and most importantly, it supports parallel test case execution. So they have introduced a utility called Selenium Side Runner that allows you to run your test cases on any browser. So you can create your automation using IDEC on Chrome or Firefox, but through command prompt, 
using your site runner you can execute this test cases on any browser thus by achieving your cross browser testing control flow statement so initially in the previous versions of ide there were control flow statements available however one had to install a plugin to use them but now it is made available out of box and what are this control flow statements these are nothing but your if else conditions the while loops the switch case and so on it also has an improved locator functionality that means it provides a failover mechanism for locating elements on your web page so let's look at how this id looks and how do we install it and start working on that so for that let me take you to my browser so say let's go to the firefox browser so on this browser i already have the id installed so when you already have an id installed you will see an icon here which says selenium id and how do you install this you simply need to go to your firefox add-ons here where it says find more extension so just type in selenium id and search for this extension so in the search results you see the selenium id just click on that and now since i've already installed here it says remove otherwise for you it is going to give you an add button here just click on the add button it will install this extension once it is installed you should be able to see this selenium id icon here okay so now let's go ahead and launch this id so when i click on that it is going to show me a welcome page where it's going to give me a few options the first option is it says record a new test case in a new project so straight away if you choose this option you can start recording a test case in which case it's going to just create a default project for you which you can save it later then open an existing project so you can open if you've already have a saved project create a new project and close so i already have an existing project with me for the demo purpose so i'll go ahead and open that so i'll say open existing project and i have created a simple script what the script does is it logs me into the facebook using a dummy user mail uh, sorry username and password that's all it's a very simple script with few lines and this is what it's going to do so what we will simply do is we'll just run the script and see how it works for that i'm just going to reduce the test execution speed so that you should be able to see every step of execution here all right so what i'll do now here is i'll just adjust this window and i'll just simply say run current test all right so i'll just get this side by side so that you should be able to see what exactly the script is doing okay so now you are able to see both the windows okay so now it's going to type in your user email here there you go and now it'll enter the password and it has clicked on the login button so it's going to take a while to say login and since these are the dummy ids it is you are not able to log in here and you're going to see this error window fine that is what is the expected output here now on the id if you look here after i execute the test case every statement or every command which i have used here is colored coded in green so that means this particular step was executed successfully and then here in the log window it will give you a complete log of this test case right from the first step till the end and your end result is it says fb login which is my test case name completed successfully let's look at few components of this id the first one is the menu bar so let's go to our id all right so the menu bar is right here on the top so here is your project name so either you can add a new project here or rename your project so since we already have this project which is named as facebook and then on the right you have options to create a new project open an existing project or save the current project and then comes our toolbar so using the options in this toolbar you can control the execution of your test cases so first one here is the recording button so this is what you use when you start recording your script and then on the left you have two options here to run your test cases the first one is run all tests so in case you have multiple test cases written here you can execute them one by one sequentially by using this run all test else what you can do is if you just want to run your current test this is what you would use then id has this debugger option which you can use to do a step execution so say for example now whenever i run the script it's going to execute each and every command here sequentially so instead if i just select the first command and say do step execution all right so what it does is the moment it finishes the first command which is opening of facebook right i think which is already done here yeah all right so once this is done it is going to wait immediately on the second command and it says pause the debugger so from here you can do whatever you would like to do in case you want to change the command here you can do that you can pause your execution you can resume your execution here right you can even completely stop your test execution or you can just 
select this to run the rest of the test case. So if we say run the test case, what it is going to do is it's just going to simply go ahead and complete the com complete the test case. Now there is another option here, which is you see the timer there, which says test execution speed. So to execute your test cases in the speed you want. Say whenever you're developing an automation script, right? And say you want to give a demo. So you need to control the speed sometimes so that the viewer is able to exactly see all the steps which is being performed. And this gives you an option to control that complete execution, right? So do you see the grading here? So we have somewhere from fast to completely slow execution. So the previous demo which I showed was I controlled the speed and then I executed it so that we could see every command how it has been executed. All right, so what's the next? This is called as an address bar. So whichever, wherever, whenever you enter an URL here, that is where you want to conduct your test. And another thing what it does is it keeps a history of all the URLs which you have used for running your test. Then here is where your script is recorded. So each and every instruction is displayed here in the order in which you have recorded the script. And then if you look here, you have something called as log and reference. So now log is an area where it records each and every step of your command as in when they get executed. Right. So if you see here, it says open HTTPS Facebook.com and OK. So that means this command was executed successfully. And after the complete test case is done, it gives you whether the test case passed or failed. So in case there is a failure, you'll immediately see this test case is failed in red color. Also, there is something called as reference here. For example, say if I click on any of this command, the reference tab, what it is going to show me is a details of this command, which I have used in the script. It gives you the details of the command as well as what the arguments have been used or how how is that you need to be using this particular command. Okay, so now what we'll do is let's go ahead and write a simple script using this ID. So with this, you'll get an idea as how do we actually record scripts in ID. So for that, I have a use case here, a very, very simple use case. So what we will do is we will open Amazon.in. Then we'll search, simply search for say a product iPhone. And once we get that search page where all your iPhones are displayed, we will just do an assert on the title of the page. Simple. All right. So let's do that. So first thing what I need is an URL. Okay. So first, let me go to my Firefox browser here and say Amazon.in. So why I'm doing this just to simply get the right URL, absolute URL path here. And so that I don't make any mistakes while typing in the URL. Okay. So I got this. So let me close all these windows. I don't need any of this. Let's minimize this. Alright, so here what I will do in the tests tab, I will say add a new test and let name this test as uh, Amazon search done. I will say add. Now I will enter this URL which I just copied it from my browser. Okay, And then I will just say start recording. So what it that did was since I have entered the URL in this address box, it just opened the Amazon.in URL. Now let's do the, our test case. So in my test case, what I said was I want to search for iPhone. Once I have this, I'm just going to click on my search button. So now this gives me a list of all iPhones. And then I said, I want to add an assertion on the title of this page. So for me to do that, what ID gives me an option is I have to just right click anywhere on this page and you'll see the Selenium ID options here. So in this, I will select assert title and then I will close this browser. So that kind of completes my test case. So now take a look at all the steps which is created for me. So it says open slash because I've already provided the URL here. So either you can replace it with your regular URL or you can just leave it as it is. So what I will do since this is going to be a proper script and I might be using this to run it from my command prompt also. So I'll just replace this target with the actual URL. And then what it is doing, it is setting a window size. Then there are whatever I did on that particular URL on that website, it has recorded all the steps for me. So this is where it says type into this particular text box which is my search box and what did it type iPhone this was the value which I entered now there was one more feature which I told you in this new ID which had which I said it has a failover mechanism for your locating techniques now that is what this is now if you look here this ID is equal to two tab search text box this is nothing but that search box where we entered the text iPhone and it has certain identification through which this ID identifies that web element and that has multiple options to select that particular search box. So right now what it has used is ID is equal to two tab search box. However, if you know the different locating techniques, you will be able to see here that it has other 
techniques also which it has identified like the name and the CSS and the XPath. So how does this help in failover is say tomorrow if Amazon.in website changes the ID of this element, right? You are not going to come and rewrite the scripts again. Instead, by using the same script, what it will do is if this particular ID fails, if it is unable to find the element using the first locator, which is the ID, it simply moves to the next available ones and it tries to search for that element until one of these becomes true. That is what was the failure mechanism which has got added now. It's a very brilliant feature because most of our test cases break because of element location techniques. Well, let's come back to this. So then we added an assert title, right? So what is assert title here? It simply captures the title of that particular page and it checks. This is all a very simple test case. So what we will do now is we will stop the recording and then I've also given a closed browser. So right now what I'll do is I'll just comment this out. Why? Because if I just run this test case, it's going to be very fast and you might not be able to catch the exact command execution what has happened. All right. So right now I'll just disable it so that it will just do all these test cases and it just stays there without closing the browser. So now I'll just say run the current test case. So your Amazon in is launched. Okay, it was typed in the iPhone. It's also clicked on the search. So it is done. So now if you look here, since we are in the reference tab, it is not able to show. So let's go to the log. And now let's see the log. So it's going to be a running log. So if you notice here, the previous examples which we have run for Facebook is also in the same log. So we will have to see the log from running Amazon search because that's our test case. So if you see here, every command line, right, was executed successfully. Assert title was also done and your test case was executed successfully. So it passed. Now what we will do is on this assert title, I'll just modify this and let's say just add some text. I'll just add double S here. Now this by intentionally, I'm going to fail this test case just to show you that whenever there is a test case failure, how does the ID behaves and how do you get to know the failures? All right. So I'll just run the test, test case again. So before that, let's close the previous window. All right, done. And now here I'll also uncomment the close because anyway, it's a failure which I'm going to see, which I should be able to see it in the logs. So I'll close the browser after the execution of test case. Okay, so let's simply go and run the test case. Okay, Amazon.in is launched. It should search for iPhone now. Yeah, there you go. All right. Now it should also close the browser. Yes, it has closed the browser and it has failed. Now see here. Now this is the line where our command failed. Why? Because the expected title was not there. And if you look in the logs, it says your assert title on Amazon.in failed actual result was something different and it did not match with what we had asked it for. So this is how simple it is to use your ID to create your automation scripts. So we saw all the components of ID. We saw the record button, then I showed you the toolbar, I showed you the editor box and also the test execution log. So now let's come to what are the limitations of this ID. With ID, you cannot export your scripts, your test scripts to web driver scripts. This support is not yet added, but it is in the works. Data driven testing, like using your Excel files or reading data from the CSV files and passing it to the script. This capability is still not available. Also, you cannot connect to database for reading your test data or perform any kind of database testing. With Selenium WebDriver, yes, you can. Also, unlike Selenium WebDriver, you do not have a good reporting mechanism with the ID. Like say, for example, test ng or report ng. So that brings us to the next component of the suite, which is Selenium RC, Selenium Remote Control. So Selenium RC was developed by Paul Hammond. He refactored the code, which was developed by Jason and was credited with Jason as a co-creator of Selenium. Selenium server is written in Java. It is used to write web application tests in different programming languages, as it supports multiple programming languages like your Java, C Sharp, Perl, Python, and Ruby. It interacts with a browser with the help of an RC server. So this RC server uses a simple HTTP GET and POST request for communication. And as I said earlier also, Selenium RC was called as Selenium 1.0 version. But it got deprecated in Selenium 2.0 and was completely removed in 3.0 and it got replaced by what? WebDriver. And we'll see why this happened and what was that issue which we had with the RC server. So this is the architecture of Selenium remote control at a very high level. So when Jason Huggins introduced Selenium, you know the tool was called as JavaScript program. 
and then that was also called as a selenium core. So every HTML has a JavaScript statements which are executed by web browser and there is a JavaScript engine which helps in executing this command. Now this RCA had one major issue. Now what was that issue? Say for example, you have a test script, say test.javascript here, which you are trying to access elements from anywhere from the google.com domain. So what used to happen is every element which is accessible are the elements which can belong only to google.com domain. Like say for example, mail, the search or the drive. So any elements from this can be accessible through your test scripts. However, nothing outside the domain of say google.com in this case was accessible. Say for example, if your test scripts wanted to access something from yahoo.com, this was not possible. And this is due to the security reasons obviously. Now to overcome that, the testers what they had to do was they had to install the selenium core and the web server which contained your web application which is under test on the same machine. And imagine if you have to do this for every machine which is under test. This is not going to be feasible or even effective all the time. And this issue is called as a same origin policy. Now what a same origin policy issue says is it prohibits a JavaScript from accessing elements or interacting with scripts from a domain different from where it is launched. And this is purely for the security measure. So if you have written a scripts which can access your google.com or anything related to google.com, these scripts cannot access any elements outside the domain. Like as we said in the example yahoo.com. This was the same origin policy. Now to overcome this, what this gentleman did was he created something called as Selenium Remote Control Server. To trick the browser in believing that your core, your Selenium core and your web application under test are from the same domain. And this is what was the uh, Selenium remote control. So if you look at again a high level architecture or how did this actually work. First you write your test scripts which is here right in any of the supported language like your PHP or your Java or Python. And before we start testing we need to launch this RC server which is a separate application. So this Selenium server is responsible for receiving the Selenius commands. And these Selenius commands are the ones which you have written in your script. It interprets them and reports the result back to your test. So all that is done through your RC server. The browser interaction which happens through RC server, right, from here to your browser. So this happens through a simple HTTP and uh, post and get request. And that is how your RC server and your browser communicate. And how exactly this communication happens? This RC server, it acts like a proxy. So say your test scripts asks to launch a browser. So what happens is this commands goes to your server and then your RC server launches the browser. It injects the JavaScript into the browser. Once this is done, all the subsequent calls from your test script, right, from your test scripts to your browser goes through your RC. And now upon, upon receiving these instructions, your Selenium core executes these actual commands as JavaScript commands on the browser. And then the test results are displayed back from your browser to your RC to your test scripts. So the same cycle gets repeated right until the complete test case execution is over. So for every command what you write in your JavaScript here or your test script here goes through a complete cycle of going through the RC server to the browser collecting the results again from the RC server back to your test scripts. So this cycle gets repeated for every command until your complete test execution is done. So RC had definitely a lot of shortcomings and what are those? So RC server needs to be installed before running any test scripts which we just saw. So that was an additional setup since it acts as a mediator between your commands which is your Selenius commands and your browser. The architecture of RC is complicated. Why? Because of its intermediate RC server which is required to communicate with the browser. The execution of commands takes very long. It is slower. We know why because every command in this takes a full trip from the test script to your RC server to the core engine to the browser and then back to the same route which makes your overall test execution very slow. Lastly, the APIs supported by RC are very redundant and confusing. So RC does have a good number of APIs. However, it is less object oriented. So they are redundant and confusing. Say for example, say if you want to write into a text box how and when to use a type key command or just a type command is always confusing. Another example is some of the mouse commands using a click or a mouse down. Both kind of you know almost providing a similar functionality. So that is the kind of confusion which developers used to create. Hence 
selenium rc got deprecated and is no more available in later selenium versions it is obsolete now now to overcome these shortfalls webdriver was introduced so while rc was introduced in 2004 webdriver was introduced by simon stewart in 2006 it's a cross platform testing platform so webdriver can run on any platform like say linux windows mac or even if you have a ubuntu machine you can run your selenium scripts on this machine it is a programming interface to run test cases it is not an id and how does this work actually so test cases are created and executed using web elements or objects using the object locator and the webdriver method so when i do a demo you will understand what this webdriver methods are and how do we locate the web elements on the web page it does not require a core engine like rc so it is pretty fast why because webdriver interacts directly with the browser and it does not have that intermediate server like the uh, rc hat so each browser in this case what happens is each browser has its own driver on which the application runs and this driver is responsible to make the browser understand the commands which you will be passing from the script like say for example click of a button or you want to enter some text so through your script you tell which browser you want to work with say chrome and then the chrome driver is responsible for interpreting your instructions and to execute it on the web application launched on the chrome browser so like rc webdriver also supports multiple programming languages in which you can write your test scripts so another advantage of webdriver is it supports various frameworks like test ng j unit n unit and report ng so when we talk about the limitations of webdriver you will appreciate how this support for various frameworks and tool help in making the selenium a complete automation solution for web application so let's look at the architecture of webdriver at a high level what is in webdriver so webdriver consists of four major components the first one is we have got client libraries right or what we also call it as language bindings so since selenium supports multiple language and you are free to use any of the supported languages to create your automation script these libraries are made available on your selenium website which you need to download and then write your scripts accordingly so let's go and see from where do we download this so if i go to my browser so seleniumhq.org right so if you're working with selenium this website is your bible so anything and everything you need to know about selenium right you need to come here and use all the tabs here in this website so right now what we are going to look at is what are those language bindings so for that i'll have to go to this download tab here okay and if you scroll down here you will see something like selenium client and web driver language binding and for each of the supported language of selenium you have a download link right so say for example if you're working with java here what you need to do is you need to download your java language binding so let's go back to the presentation so this is where your language bindings are available next so selenium provides lots of apis for us to interact with the browser and when we do the demo i'll be showing you some of this apis right and these are nothing but the rest apis and everything whatever we do through the script happens through the rest calls then we have a json wire protocol what is json java script object notation it is nothing but a standard for exchanging data over the web so for example you want to say launch a web application through your script so what selenium does it it creates a json payload and posts the request to the browser driver that is here and then we have this browser drivers themselves and as i said there is a specific driver for each browser as you know every tool has its own limitation so does selenium so let's look at what these limitations are and if there are any workarounds for them cannot test mobile applications requires framework like apm selenium is for automating web application it cannot handle mobile applications Mobile applications are little different and they need its own set of automation tool. However, what Selenium provides is a support for integrating this APM tool, which is nothing but a mobile application automation tool. And using APM and Selenium, you can still achieve mobile application automation. And when do you usually need this? When your application under test is also supported on mobile devices, you would want a mechanism to run the same test cases on web browser as well as your mobile browsers right so this is how you achieve it 
the next limitation so when we talked about the components of selenium i said that with web driver we can achieve only sequential execution however in real time scenario we cannot just live with this we need to have a mechanism to run our test cases parallelly on multiple machines as well as on multiple browsers so though this is a limitation of web driver but what selenium offers is something called as grid which helps us achieve this and we will see in shortly what the selenium grid is all about also if you want to know more details as how do we work with the grid how do you want to install that grid so do check out our video uh, on simply learn website on selenium grid third limitation so limited cap reporting capability so selenium web driver has a limited reporting capability it can create basic reports but what we definitely need is a more so it does support some tools like say test ng report ng and even extent reports which you can integrate with selenium and generate beautiful reports powerful isn't it also there are other challenges uh, with selenium like selenium is not very good with image testing especially for the ones which are designed for web application automation but then we have other tools which can be used along with selenium like auto it and securely so if you look at all this selenium still provides a complete solution for your automation need and that's the beauty of selenium and that is why it makes the most popular tool of today for automation okay let's do a quick comparison between the selenium rc and the web driver so rc has a very complex architecture you know why because of the additional rc server whereas due to direct interaction with the browser web driver architecture is pretty simple execution speed it is slower in rc and much faster in web driver why because in web driver we have eliminated that complete layer of selenium server right that the rc server and we established a direct communication with the browser through browser drivers it requires an rc server to interact with the browsers we just talked about it and whereas web driver can directly interact with the browser so rc again we talked about this as one of the limitations that we have lot of redundant apis which kept developers guessing as which api to use for what functionality however web driver offers pretty clean apis to work with rc did not offer any support for headless browser whereas in web driver you do have a support for using headless browsers let's see the web driver in action now now for the demo we will use this particular use case and what this use case says is navigate to the official simply learn website then type the selenium in search bar and click on it and click on the selenium 3.0 training so we are basically searching for selenium 3.0 training on the simply learn website first let's do the steps manually and then we will go ahead and write the automation script so let's go to my browser on my browser what i'll do is i'll let me first launch the simply learn website okay and here what my use case step says is i need to search for selenium and click on the search button so once i do that it is going to give me a complete list of all kind of selenium trainings which is available with simply learn and what i'm interested in is the selenium 3.0 training here once i find this on the web page i need to go and click on that all right so this is all the steps which we are going to perform in this use case okay now so for writing the test cases i'll be using an id which is eclipse i have already installed my eclipse and also i have installed selenium in this instance of my eclipse all right so if you can see the reference library folder here you will see all the jars which are required for the selenium to work next another prereq which is required for selenium and that is your driver files now every browser which you want to work with has its own driver file to execute your selenium scripts and since for this demo i'll be working with the firefox browser i will need a driver file for firefox now driver file for firefox is the gecko driver which i have already downloaded and placed in my folder called drivers now where did i download this from let's go ahead and see that so if i go back to my browser and if you go to your selenium hq dot website you have to go to this download tab here in the download tab when you scroll down you will see something like third party drivers bindings and plugins in this you will see the list of all the browsers which is supported by selenium and against each of this browser you will find a link which has the driver files now since we'll be using the gecko driver this is the link where you need to go to and depending on which operating system which you are working on you need to download that particular file 
Now, since I'm working on Mac, this is the file which I'm using. If you're a Windows user, you need to download this zip file and unzip it. So once you unzip that, you would get a file called Gecko driver for your Firefox or a Chrome driver for your Chrome browser. And then what you do is you just create a directory called drivers under your project and just place the driver files here. So these are the two prereqs for your Selenium. One is importing your jar files like this and then having your drivers downloaded and keep them under a folder where you can reference to. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and create a class. I already have a package created in this project. So I'll use this project and create a new class. So I'll say create new Java class and let's call this as search training. I'll be using a public static void main and I'll click on finish. So let's remove this auto generated lines as we do not need them. All right. Now the first statement which you need to write before even you start writing the rest of your code is what you need to do is you need to define or declare your driver variable using your class web driver. So what I would do is I'll say web driver driver done. All right. Now you'll see that this ID is going to flash some errors for you. That means it is going to ask you to import certain libraries which is required by the web driver. So simply just go ahead and say import web driver from org.opensq.selenium. This is the package which we will need. All right. So you have a driver created which is of the class web driver. And now after this, I'm going to create three methods. All right. So first method I will have for launching the Firefox browser. Okay. And then I will write a simple method for searching Selenium training and clicking on it. This is the actual use case what we'll be doing. And then third method I'm going to write is just to close the browser which I'm going to be opening, right? So these are the different methods which I'll be creating. And from the public static void main, I will just call these methods one after the other, okay? So let's go ahead and write the first method. Now my first method is launching the Firefox browser. So I'll say public void, since my return type is null or there is no return type for this, let's call it as launch browser. Okay. All right. Now in this for launching any browser, I need to mention two steps. Now the first step is where I need to do a system.set property. Okay. Let's do that first and then I'll explain what this does. I'll just say system.set property. So this accepts a key and a value pair. So what is my key here? My key here is web driver dot gecko dot driver and I need to provide a value. So value is nothing but the path to the gecko driver. And we know that this gecko driver, which I'm going to use here is right here in the same project path under the drivers folder. Correct. And that is what the path which I'm going to provide here. So here simply I need to say drivers slash gecko driver. G-E-C-K-O. All right. Done. And let me close this sentence. All right. Now, since I'm a Mac user, my Gecko driver installable is just the name Gecko driver. If you're a Windows user and if you're running your Selenium scripts on the Windows machine, you need to provide a complete path to this, including .exe because driver executable on your machines is going to be Gecko driver .exe. All right. So just make sure that your path, which you mentioned here in the system.set property is the correct path. Okay. Then the next thing what we need to do is I need to just say driver is equal to new Firefox driver. Okay. So this command new Firefox driver creates an instance of the Firefox browser. Now this is also flagging me error. Why? Because again, it's going to ask me to import the packages where the Firefox driver class is present. Okay. We did that. Now these two lines are responsible for launching the Firefox browser form. So this is done. So what's my next step in the use case? Now I need to launch the website simply learn. So for that, we have a command called driver.get. Driver.get, what it does is whatever URL you're going to give it here in this double quotes as an argument, it is going to launch that particular website. And for us, it's a simply learn website. So what I do as a best practice is instead of typing out the URL, I go to my browser, launch that URL, which I want to test. And I simply copy it, come back to your Eclipse and just simply paste it. So this ensures that I do not make any mistakes in the URL. Okay. So done. So our first method is ready where we are launching the browser, which is our Firefox browser and then launching the simply learn website. Now the next method, what is my next method? In my next method, I need to give the search string to search 
Selenium training on this particular website. Now for that we need to do few things. What are those few things? Let's go to the website again. All right. So let me relaunch this. Let's close this. Okay. Let me remove all this and let's go to the home page first. Okay. This is my home page. So as you saw when I did a manual testing of this, I entered the text here. So now since I have to write a script for this, first I need to identify what this element is. For that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say right click here and I'll say inspect element. All right. Now this element, let's see what attribute it has, which I can use for finding this element. So I, I see that there is an ID present. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply use this ID and then I'll just copy this ID from here. Go back to Eclipse. Let's write a method first. So I'll say public void. And what do we give the method name? Say search training or just search. All right. Now in this, I need to use a command called driver dot find element by id is what i'm going to use as a locating technique and in double quotes the id which i copied from the website is what i'm going to paste here okay and then what am i going to do on this element is i need to send that text the text which i'm going to search for which is selenium so i'll just say send keys and whatever text i want to send i need to give it in double quotes so for that selenium so this is done so now i've entered the text here and after entering the text i need to click on this button so for that i need to first know what that button is so let's inspect that search button okay now if you look at the search button other than the tag which is span and the class name i do not have anything here all right so what i can do is i can either use the class name or i can write an x path since this is a demo which we have already used id locating technique i would go ahead and use the x path here so for me to construct an x path uh, i will copy this class first okay and then I already have a crow path installed on my Firefox. So I'll use the crow path and first test my X path. So I'll just say double slash. Let's see what was that element. It has a span tag. Okay. So I'll have to use span and at class equal to and I'll just copy the class name here. And let's see if it can identify that element. Yeah. So it is able to identify. So I'll just use this X path in my code. So I'll go back to Eclipse and I'll say driver dot find element by dot X path. And the X path which I just copied from crow path is what I'm going to paste here. And what is the action I need to do here? I need to say click. Done. So I have reached a stage where I've entered this selenium. Okay. And then I have clicked on the search button. Once I do this, I know that expected result is I should be able to find this particular link here. Selenium 3.0 training. Okay. And I should be able to click on that. So for that, again, I need to inspect this. So let's inspect this selenium 3.2 all right so now what are the elements this has now this particular element has attributes like it has a tag h2 then it has got some class name and some other attributes so i would again would like to use a x path here now this time while using the x path i'm going to make use of a text functionality so that i can search for this particular text so i'll simply copy this i'll go to my crow path the tag is h2 so i'll say simply h2 Okay, and here I'll say text equal to, and this is the text which I copied. I missed out that yes there, so I'm just going to add an S. Okay, so let's first test here whether it is able to identify that element. Yeah, so it is able to identify. So can you see a blue dotted line? It is able to show us which element it is identified. So I'll copy this X path now and let's go to my ID Eclipse. So now here, what I need to do is I'll have to again simply say, driver dot find element by dot x path and paste the x path which we just did and then again i have to do a click operation done all right so technically we have taken all the steps of the use case and we have written the commands for that all right now let's add an additional thing here say after coming to this page after finding this we want to uh, say print the title of this page now what is the title of this page if you just hover your mouse on this it says online and classroom training for professional certification courses simply done so what i will do is after doing all these operations i will just print out this page title on our console so for that i have to just do this driver dot uh, so let's do a sys out so i'll say sys out system dot out dot print ln okay and here i would say let's add a text here the page title is and then let's append it with driver dot get title 
So this is the command which we'll be using to fetch the page title. Done. Now what is the last method I need to add? Just to close the browser. All right. So let me add a method here. I'll say public void close browser and it's is one single command which I need to call. I'll say driver dot quit. Okay. And then I need to call all these methods from my public static void main. So I let me use my class name which is this. So I'm going to create an object obj is equal to new class name and then using this object first is I need to call the method launch browser and then I'll call the method search right and then I'll call the method close browser done. So technically our script is ready with all the functionality which we wanted to cover from our use case. Now there are few other tweaks which I need to do this and I'll tell you why I need to do this. Now for example after we click here right after we click on the search if you observed on your website, it took a little while before it listed out all the Selenium trainings for us. And usually when you're actually doing it, you wait for the Selenium 3.0 training to be available and then you click on that. Now, same thing, you also need to tell your scripts to do that. You need to tell your scripts to wait for a while until you start seeing the Selenium 3.0 training or it appears on your web page. There are multiple ways to do that in your script and it is a part of overall synchronization what we call where we use kind of implicit and explicit kind of a ways. Now since this is a demo, for demo purpose what I am going to do is I am going to use a command called thread.sleep and I am just going to give an explicit wait of say 3 seconds. So you can use this mainly for the demo purposes. You can use a thread.sleep command. Now this thread.sleep command needs us to handle some exceptions. So I'm just going to click on add throws declaration and say interrupted exception. Now same thing I'll have to do it in my main function also. Okay, so let's do that and complete it. All right, so this is done. So by doing this, what am I doing? I'm ensuring that before I click on the Selenium 3. Training, we are giving enough time for the script to wait until the web page shows this link to the Selenium 3. Training. That's one thing I'm doing. All right. And also now since you are going to be seeing this demo through the video recording, the script when it starts running, it is going to be very fast. So you might just miss out seeing how it does the send keys and how did it click on the search button. For us to enable us to see it properly, I'll just add some explicit weights here just for our demo purpose. So after entering the keys, right? So what I'll do is I'll just give a simple thread dot sleep here. Okay, so probably a three seconds or a two seconds wait should be good enough. Okay, a three seconds wait should be good enough here so that we should be able to see how exactly this works on your browser when we execute this. Okay, now our complete script is ready. So what I'll do is I'll just save the script and then we will simply run the script. So to run the script, I'll just say right click run as Java application. Okay, it says ask me to select and save. I have saved the script now. So let's observe how it runs. Okay, the simplylearn.com, the website is launched. So the Selenium text has been entered in the search box. It has clicked on the search. Okay, all right. So now it did everything whatever we wanted it to do. All right. So since we are closing the browser, you are unable to see whether the Selenium 3. Training was selected or not. However, what I have given here is to fetch the title after all these operations were complete. And if you see here, the complete operations was done and we were able to see the page title here. Okay. So now what I'll do, since we are unable to see whether it clicked on the Selenium 3.0 training or not, I'll just comment out the closed browser, uh, the command. Okay. So we will not call the closed browser so that the browser remains open and we get to see whether did it really find the training link or not. Okay. So let me close this window. We don't need this Firefox window close all tabs and then I'll just ex re-execute this script. So I'll say run as Java application. So save the file. Okay, simply learn.com is launched. So, so search text is entered. Now it's going to click on the search button. Yes. All right. So we've got the search results. It should click on Selenium 3.0 training and yes, it is successfully able to click on that. All right. So now it's not going to close the browser because we have commented on that line. However, it did print us the title. Alright, so this is a simple way of using the Selenium scripts. Selenium Grid. So Grid is used to run multiple test scripts on multiple machines at the same time. With WebDriver, you can only do sequential execution. But in real-time environment, you always have the need to run test cases in distributed environment. And that is where Selenium Grid comes into picture. 
So grid was conceptualized and developed by Patrick. The main objective is to minimize test execution time and how by running your test parallelly. So design is in such a way that commands are distributed on multiple machines where you want to run test and all these are executed simultaneously. What do you achieve by this methodology? Of course, the parallel execution on different browsers and operating system. Grid is pretty flexible and can integrate with many tools like say you want a reporting tool integrated to pull all the reports from the multiple machines where you are running your test cases and you want to present that report in a good looking format. So you have an option to integrate such report. Okay, so how does this grid work? So grid has a hub and node concept which helps in achieving the parallel execution. Let's take an example. Say your application supports all browsers and most of the operating system. Like as in this picture, you could say one of them is a Windows machine, one of them is a Mac machine and another one say a Linux machine. So your requirement is to run the test on all supported browsers and operating system like the one which is depicted in this picture. So what you have to do is first thing is you configure a master machine or what you also call it as a hub by running something called a Selenium standalone server and this standalone server can be downloaded from the Selenium HQ website. Using the server you create a hub configuration that is this node and then you create nodes specific to your machine requirement. And how are these nodes created? You again use the same server which is your standalone Selenium server to create the node configuration. So I'll show you where the Selenium server can be downloaded. So if we go back to our Selenium HQ website, so you can see here right on the top it says Selenium standalone server. And this is the latest version available so you just need to download. Once you download this, keep a version of this one on your master machine that is your hub and this should also be present on your node machines and there is a certain command which you can use to install the server as a node and as a master depending on your configuration so once that is done you have your master and your master or the hub and the nodes created your master can control on which nodes you want to execute test now say if this is a mac machine this is a windows machine through your master or your hub, you control on which machine you want to execute what tests. Then also you could have a multiple combination of tests. Like say for example, smoke test to be run on all these nodes. That's the kind of configuration you can create. Or a certain component test to be run on say only Windows 10 with an Edge browser. Or say regression test on Mac machine. So any such things, whatever configurations you have for your node, what happens is the hub picks the right node which conforms to your requirements or the configurations which you have set up and then sends a command to the node to execute those test cases on the node. Everything is controlled through your master machine only here. What happens on the node? So once the node gets the command from the master, the node actually runs all the test cases which, is it, which it intends to run on the specific browser which you have mentioned in your configuration file. So this is a very high level architecture and how a grid works. So if you want to know more details of how the grid works, you can refer to our video on Simply Learn. All right, again, limitations. So what limitation does this grid have now? The first one, is it has relatively poor scalability compared to many modern applications. It is pretty static. Each server is configured in advance with a subset of required browser instances available. So if you want to vary this, you will need to reconfigure. So any configuration tomorrow on any machines you want to change, it cannot be done automatically. You need to completely reconfigure that node and then add it back to the grid. Thirdly, although it is available to run on virtual servers, it is actually not designed as a cloud native application. And because of, as a result of this, it isn't optimized to take advantage of things like say distributed storage or dynamic scaling or even automatic failover. So these are some of the limitations of the grid. Advantages of Selenium. Speed and accuracy. Of course, since there is no manual execution, your test can run faster and with grid, it helps in parallel execution and you can run or execute large volumes of test within a very short time frame. Let's take an example. Say before, just before the release of your product, say during the last lap of your testing, you find a bug and of course it has to be fixed. So the developer fixes the bug and you want to run all the test cases pertaining to that area. Now, can you imagine that if you have to do this testing manually, how long it's going to take? 
So by automation, you can achieve this in a very short duration of time and it will also help you release your product in time with very minimal or absolutely no human errors. The second advantage, it's an open source, so it's available free of cost, so anyone can download it and start using it. It supports wide spectrum of programming languages we have been seeing throughout this presentation. It is not restricted to any particular programming language. So whatever language you are comfortable with, you have an option to use that and write your Selenium scripts. Selenium has support for almost all browsers and operating system. We also talked about headless browser support. So this helps you create test cases once using any of the browser and run them across all browsers and all operating system. Thus saving you a lot of time from manual execution and helping in achieving a very broad test coverage. And we also saw that pretty easy to use tool, right? So you can check out all our videos and you can, it's just a matter of time that you can master the skill of writing your automation scripts. Reusability. Of course, like any programming language, it provides you a mechanism to reuse your code and avoid redundancy. Well, again, let's see an overall what are the limitations of Selenium itself. Now, since Selenium is open source, that is one of the biggest advantage. Now, there is a little disadvantage which comes with that. And what is it? You do not have much technical support because it's an open source code. However, there are loads and loads of documentations and forums available which you can definitely refer to. And Selenium, as we said, it is only for automating web applications. It cannot handle the mobile applications or even the desktop application. However, it does provide support for integrating tools like APM for mobile testing. Selenium is not very good with image testing, especially designed for your web application tools. Again, we have tools like AutoIt and SQLite, which can be integrated with Selenium. Selenium WebDriver has limited, limited reporting capability, but again, it does provide us support for integrating tools like TestNG, ReportNG and ExtendReport. It does not have test management capabilities. It need not, right? Not one tool need not have each and everything what is required, but there is always a way to integrate it. So Selenium does provide a way to integrate any of the test management tools. Now, since Selenium supports multiple programming language, the developer of test automation will require to have some basic knowledge of any of the programming language it supports to write effective automation scripts. Right? So this you could look at it as an advantage or as a disadvantage. So overall, if you look at all this, right, Selenium still provides a complete solution for our automation need. And that is why we can still say that Selenium is one of the most popular tool used in the industry today for your web application automation. Simply Learn's postgraduate program in DevOps with Caltech University in collaboration with IBM should be your right choice. For more details on this program, please use the link in the description box below. Hello and welcome to continuous integration tutorial using Jenkins. My name is Chidanand and I am with the Simply Learn team. Today, let's get started with Jenkins. Jenkins, in my opinion, is one of the most popular continuous integration servers of recent times. What began as a hobby project by a developer working for Sun Microsystems way back in early or mid 2000s has gradually and eventually evolved into very, very powerful and robust automation servers. It has a wide adoption since it is released under MIT license and is almost free to use. Jenkins has a vast developer community that supports it by writing all kinds of plugins. Plugins is the heart and soul of Jenkins because using plugins, one can connect Jenkins to anything and everything under the sun. With that introduction, let's get into what all will be covered as a part of this tutorial. I will get into some of the prerequisites required for installing Jenkins, post which I will go ahead and install Jenkins on a Windows box. There are a few first time configurations that needs to be done and I will be covering those as well. So once I have Jenkins installed and configured properly, I will get into the user administrative part. I'll create few users and I will use some plugins for setting up various kinds of access permissions for these users. I will also put in some freestyle jobs. Freestyle job is nothing but a very, very simple job. And I will also show you the powerfulness of Jenkins by scheduling this particular job to run based upon a time schedule. I will also connect Jenkins with uh, GitHub. GitHub is our source code where source code repository where I've got some repositories put up there. So using Jenkins, I will connect to GitHub, pull up a repository that is existing on GitHub onto the Jenkins box and run few commands to build this particular repository that is pulled from GitHub. 
sending out emails is a very very important configurations of Jenkins or any other continuous integration server for that matter whenever there is any notifications that has to be sent out as a part of either a build going bad or build being good or build being propagated to some environment and all these scenarios you would need the continuous integration servers to be sending out notifications so I will get into a little bit details of how to configure Jenkins for sending out emails I will also get into a scenario where I would have a web application a Maven based Java web application which will be pulled from a github repository and I will deploy it onto a Tomcat server the Tomcat server will be locally running on my system eventually I will get into one other very very important topic which is the master slave configuration it's a very very important and pretty interesting topic where distributed builds is achieved using a master slave configuration so I will bring up a slave I will connect the slave with the master and I'll also put in a job and kind of delegate that particular job to the slave configuration finally I will let you know how to use some plugins to back up your Jenkins so Jenkins has got a lot of useful information set up on it in terms of the build environments in terms of workspace all this can be very very easily backed up using a plugin so this is what I'm going to be covering as a part of this tutorial Jenkins is a web application that is written in Java and there are various ways in which you can use and install Jenkins I have listed popular three mechanisms in which Jenkins is usually installed on in any system the topmost one is as a Windows or a Linux based services so if at all you have Windows like the way I have and I'm going to use this mechanism for this demo so I would download a MSI installer that is specific to Jenkins and install this service so whenever I install it as a service it goes ahead and nicely installs all that is required for my Jenkins and I have a service that can be started or stopped based upon my need any flavor of Linux as well one other way of running Jenkins is downloading this generic war file and as long as you have JDK installed you can launch this war file by the command opening up a command prompt or shell prompt if at all you're on Linux box specifying Java hyphen jar and the name of this war file it typically brings up your web application and you know you can continue with your installation the only thing being if at all you want to stop using Jenkins you just go ahead and close this prompt you either do a control C and then bring down this prompt and your Jenkins server would be down other older versions of Jenkins were run popularly using this way in which you already have a Java based web server running up and running so you kind of drop in this war file into the root folder or the HTTPD root folder of your web server so Jenkins would explode and kind of bring up your application all user credentials or user administration is all taken care of by the Apache or the Tomcat server or the web server on which Jenkins is running this was a very older way of running but still some people use it because if they don't want to maintain two servers if they already have a Java web server which it's being nicely maintained and backed up Jenkins can run attached to it all right so either ways it doesn't matter however you're going to bring up your Jenkins instance the way we're going to operate Jenkins is all going to be very very same or similar one with the subtle changes in terms of user administration if at all you're launching it through any other web server which will take care of the user administration otherwise all the commands or all the configuration or the way in which I'm going to run this demo it is going to be same across any of these installations all right so the prerequisites for running Jenkins as I mentioned earlier Jenkins is nothing but a simple web application that is written in Java so all that it needs is Java preferably JDK 1.7 or 1.8 2 GB RAM is the recommended RAM for running Jenkins and also like any other open source tool sets when you install JDK ensure that you set in the environment variable Java home to point to the right directory this is something very specific to JDK but for any other open source tools that you've installed there is always a preferred environment variable that you got to set in which is specific to that particular tool that you're going to use this is a generic thing that is there for you know for any other open source projects because the way open source projects discover themselves is using this environment variables so as a general practice or a good practice always set these environment variables accordingly so I already have JDK 1.8 installed on my system but in case you do not what I would recommend is just navigate on your browser to the Oracle homepage and just type in or search for install JDK 1.8 and navigate to the Oracle homepage you'll have to accept the license agreement and there are a bunch of installers that is that you can pick up based upon the operating system on which you're running so I have this Windows 64 installer that is already installed and running on my system so I will not get into the details of downloading this or installing it let me show you once I install this what I've done with regard to my path so if you get into environment variables 
all right so i have just set in a java home variable if you see this c colon program files java jdk 1.8 this is where my my java is located c program files c program files java okay so this is the home directory of my jdk so that is what i have been i have set it up here in my environment variable so if you see here this is my java home all right one other thing to do is ensure that in case you want to run java or java c from a command prompt ensure that you also add that path into this path variable so if you see this somewhere i will see yes there you go c colon program files java jdk 1.8 bin so with these two i'll ensure that my java installation is nice and you know good enough so to check that to double check that or to verify that let me just open up a simple command prompt and if i type in java hyphen version all right and java c hyphen version so the compiler is on the path java is on the path and if at all i do this even the environment variable specific to my java is installed correctly so i am good to go ahead with my jenkins installation now that i have my prerequisites all set for installing jenkins let me just go ahead and download jenkins so let me open up a browser and say download jenkins all right lts is nothing but the long term support these are all stable versions weeklies i would not recommend that you try these unless until you have a real need for that um, long term support is good enough and as i mentioned there are so many flavors of jenkins that is available for download all right so what i want is yes this is the war file which is a generic war file that i was talking to you earlier and this is the windows msi installer so go ahead and in download this msi installer i already have that downloaded so let me just open that up all right so this is my downloaded jenkins instance or rather installer this is a pretty maybe a few months old but this is good enough for me before you start uh, jenkins installation just be aware of one fact that uh, there is a variable called jenkins home this is where jenkins would store all this configuration data jobs project workspace and all that specific to jenkins so by default if at all you don't set this to any particular directory if at all you install an msi installer all your installation gets into c colon program files 86 and jenkins folder if at all you run a war file depending upon the user id with which you're running your war file the jenkins folder there's a dot jenkins folder that gets created inside the user home directory so in case you have any need wherein you want to back up your jenkins or you want jenkins installations to get into some specific directories go ahead and set this jenkins home variable accordingly before you even begin your installation for now i don't need to do any of these things so i've already downloaded the installer let me just go ahead with the default installation all right so this is my jenkins msi installer i would just i don't want to make any changes into the jenkins configuration c colon program files is good for me yeah this is where all my destination folder and all the configuration specific to it goes i'm happy with this i don't want to change this i would just say go ahead and click installation okay so what typically happens once the jenkins installation gets through is it'll start installing itself and there are some small checks that needs to be done so and by default jenkins launches on the port 8080 so let me just open up localhost 8080 there's a small checking that will be done as a part of the installation process wherein i need to type in the hash key all right so there's a very very simple hash key that gets stored out here so i'll have to just copy this path if at all you're running as a war file you would see that in your logs all right so this is a simple hash key that gets created every time when you do a jenkins installation so as a part of the installation it just asks you to do this so if that is not correct it will crib about it but this looks good so it's going ahead all right one important part during the installation so you would need to install some recommended plugins what happens is the plugins are all related to each other so it's like the typical rpm kind of a problem where you try to install some plugin and it's got a dependency which is not installed and you get into all those issues 
in order to get rid of that what Jenkins recommends there's a bunch of plugins that is already recommended so just go ahead and blindly click that install recommended plugin so if you see there is a whole lot of plugins which are bare essential plugins that is required for Jenkins in order to run properly so Jenkins as a part of the installation would get all these plugins and then install it for you this is a good combination to kind of begin with and mind you at this moment Jenkins needs uh, lots of bandwidth in, in terms of network so in case your you know your network is not so good few of these plugins would kind of fail and these plugins are all you know on available on openly or or mirrored sites and sometimes some of them may be down so do not worry in case some of these plugins kind of fail to install you'd get an option to kind of retry installing them but just ensure that you know at least most or 90 95 percent of all these plugins are installed without any problems let me pause the video here for a minute and then get back once all these plugins are installed my plugin installation is all good there was no failures in any of my plugins so after that I get to create this first admin user again this is one important point that you got to remember key in given any username and password but ensure that you kind of remember that because it's very hard to get back your username and password in case you forget it all right so I'm going to create a very very simple username and password something that I can remember I will that's my name and um, an email ID is kind of optional but it doesn't allow me to go ahead in case I don't so I just give in an admin and I got a password I've got I remember my password this is my full name all right I say save and finish all right that kind of completed my Jenkins installation it was not that tough was it now that I have my Jenkins installed correctly let me quickly walk you through some bare minimal configurations that is required these are kind of a first time configuration that is required so and also let me warn you the UI is little hard for many people to wrap their head around it specifically the Windows guys but if at all you're a Java guy you know how painful it is to write UI in Java you would kind of appreciate you know all the effort that has gone into the UI bottom line you is little hard to you know wrap your head around it but once you start using it possibly you'll start liking it all right so let me get into something called as manage Jenkins this can be viewed like a, a main menu for all the Jenkins configuration so I'll get into some of those important ones something called as configure system configure system this is where you kind of put in the configuration for your complete Jenkins instance few things to kind of look out for this is a home directory this is a Java home where all the configurations all the workspace anything and everything regarding Jenkins is stored out here system message you want to put in some message on the system you just type in whatever you want and it's possibly show up somewhere up here on the menu number of executors very very important configuration this just lets Jenkins know at any point in time how many jobs or how many threads can be run you can, you can kind of visualize it like a thread that can be run on this particular instance as a thumb rule if at all you're on a single core system number of executors too should be good enough in case at any point in time if there are multiple jobs that kind of get triggered at the same time in case the number of executors are less compared to the number of jobs that have there to open up no need to panic because they will all get queued up and eventually Jenkins will get to running those jobs just bear in mind that whenever a new job kind of you know gets triggered the CPU usage and the memory usage in terms of the disk write is very high on the Jenkins instance so that's something that you got to kind of keep in mind all right but number of executors two for my system is kind of good label for my Jenkins I don't want any of these things usage how do you want to use your Jenkins this is good for me because I only have a primary uh, server that is running so I want to use this node as much as possible quite prayer each of these options have got some bare minimal help kind of a thing that is that is out there by clicking on these question marks you will get to know as to what are these particular configurations all right so this all look good what I want to show you here is something regarding the docker timestamps git plugin SVN email notifications I don't want that what I want the yes I want this SMTP server configuration remember I mentioned earlier that I would want Jenkins to be sending out some emails and what I've done here is I've just configured the SMTP details of my personal email ID in case you are in, a, in an organization 
you would have some sort of an email IDs that is set up for a Jenkins server. So you can specify the SMTP server details of your company so that you know you can authorize Jenkins to kind of send out emails. But in case you want to try it out like me, I have configured my personal email ID, which is on my Gmail for sending out notifications. So the SMTP server would be smtp.gmail.com. I'm using the SMTP authentication. I have provided my email ID and my password. I'm using the SMTP port, which is 465. And I'm, you know, reply to address is the same as mine. I can just send out an email and see if at all this configuration works. Again, Gmail would not allow you to allow anybody to send out notifications on your behalf. So you'll have to lower the security level of your Gmail ID so that you can allow a programmatically somebody to send out email notifications on your behalf. So I've done already that. I'm just trying to see if I can send a test email with the configuration that I've set in. Yes. All right. So the email configuration looks good. So this is how you configure your, uh, you know, your Gmail account in case you want to do that. If not, put in your organization SMTP server details, which are with a valid username and password and should all be set. All right. So no other configurations that I'm going to change here. All of these look good. All right, so I come back to manage Jenkins. Okay, one other thing that I want to kind of go over is the global tool configuration. Imagine this scenario or look at it this way. Jenkins is a, is a continuous integration server. It doesn't know what kind of a code base it's going to pull in, what kind of a tool set that is required, or what is the code that it's going to pull in and how is it going to build. So you would have to put in all the tools that is required for building the appropriate kind of code that you're going to pull in from you know your source code repositories so just to give an example in case your source code is a java source code and assuming that you know because in this a demo this is my laptop and i've put in all the configurations gdk everything on my laptop because i'm a developer i'm working on the laptop but my continuous integration server would be you know a separate server without anything being installed on it so in case I want Jenkins to, you know, run a Java code, I would need to install JDK on it. I need to specify the JDK location of this out here this way. Okay, since I already have the JDK installed and I've already put in the Java home directory or rather the environment variable correctly, I don't need to do it. Git, if at all I want the Jenkins server to use Git, uh, Git is a, you know, command bash or the command prompt for for running git and connecting to any other git server so you would need git to be you know installed on that particular system and set the path accordingly gradle and maven if at all you have some mavens as well you want to do this any other tool that you're going to install on your system which is your continuous integration server you will have to come in here and configure something in case you don't configure it when jenkins runs it will not be able to find these tools for building your task and it'll crib about it that's good i don't want to save anything manage jenkins let me see what else is required yes configure global security all right the security is enabled and if you see by default it's the uh, security uh, access control is set to jenkins own user database so what does this mean you know jenkins by default it uses file system where it stores all the usernames which hashes up these usernames and kind of stores them so as of now it jenkins is configured to use its own database assuming that you are running in an organization you would probably want to have a you know some sort of an ad or an ldap server using which you would want to control access to your jenkins repository rather jenkins tool so you would specify your ldap server details the root dn password or the manager DN and the manager password and all these details in case you want to connect your Jenkins instance with your LDAP or AD or any of the authentication servers that you have in your organization. But for now, since I don't have any of these things, I'm going to use this own database. That's good enough. All right. So I will set up some authorization methods and stuff like that once I put in few jobs. So for now, let me not get into any of these details of this. Just be aware that Jenkins can be connected for authorization to an LDAP server or you can have Jenkins managing its own servers, which is happening as of now. So I'm going to save all this stuff. That's good for me. So enough of all these configurations. Let me put in a very, very simple job. All right. So job, new item. You know, a little difficult to kind of figure out, but then that's the new item. So I'll just say, you know, first job, 
this is good for me i just give a name for my job i would say it's a freestyle project that's good enough for me i don't want to choose any of that so unless until you choose any of this this particular button would not become active so choose the freestyle project and say okay at a very high level you would see general source code management build triggers build environment build and post build in case you install more and more plugins you will see a lot more options but for now this is what you would see so what am i doing at the moment i'm just putting up a very very simple job and the job could be anything and everything so i don't want to put in a very complicated job for now for the demo purpose let me just put in a very very simple job i'll give a description this is an optional thing this is my first jenkins job all right i don't want to choose any of these again there are some helps available here i don't want to choose any of this i don't want to connect it to into any source code for now i don't want any triggers for now i'll come back to this in in a while build environment i don't want any build environment as a part of this build step you know i just want to you know run few things so that i kind of complete this particular job so since i'm on a windows box i would say execute windows uh, batch command all right so what do you want to do i will let me just echo something echo uh hello this is my first jenkins job and possibly i would want the date and the timestamp pertaining to the job i mean the date and time in which this job was run all right very very simple command that says you know this is my first job it just puts out something along with the date and the time all right i don't want to do anything else i want to keep this job as simple as this so let me save this job all right so once i save this job you know the job names comes up here and then i need to build this job and you would see some build history out here nothing is there as of now because i've just put in a job i have not run it yet all right so let me try to build it now you see a build number you would see a date and a timestamp so if i click on this you would see a console output if i go here okay as simple as that and where is all the job details that is getting into if you see this if i navigate to this particular directory all right so this is the directory what i was mentioning earlier regarding jenkins home so all the job related stuff that is specific to this particular jenkins installation is all here all the plugins that is installed the details of each of those plugins can be found here all right so the workspace is where all the jobs that i've created whichever i'm running would you know there will be an individual folders specific to the jobs that has been put up here all right so one job one quick run that's what it looks like pretty simple okay let me do one thing let me put up a second job i would say second job i would say freestyle project all right this is my second job i just want to demonstrate the powerfulness of the automation server and how simple it is to automate a job that is put up on jenkins it should be triggered automatically remember what i said earlier about jenkins because at the core of jenkins is a very very powerful automation server all right so what i'm going to do i will just keep everything else the same i'm going to put in a build script pretty much similar to second job that gets triggered automatically every minute all right let me do that percentage date and i'll put in the time all right so i just put in another job called second job and it pretty much does the same thing as what i was doing earlier in terms of printing the date and the time but this time i'm just going to demonstrate the powerfulness of the automation server that is there if you see here there's a build trigger so a build can be triggered using various triggers that is there so we'll get into this github uh, triggering or hook or a web hook kind of a triggering later on but for now what i want to do i want to ensure that this job that i'm going to put in would be automatically triggered on its own let's say every minute i want this job to be run on its own so build periodically is my setting if you see here there's a bunch of help that is available for me so for those of you you've written cron jobs on linux boxes you'll find it very very simple but for others don't panic let me just put up a very very simple 
regular expression for scheduling this job every minute all right so that's one two three four five Right, come up come up come up all right so five stars is all that I'm gonna put in and Jenkins got a little worried and he's asking me do you really mean every minute oh yeah I want to do this every minute let me save this and how do I check whether it gets triggered every minute or not I just don't do anything I'll just wait for a minute and if at all everything goes well Jenkins would automatically trigger my second job in a minute's time from now This time around, I'm not going to trigger anything. Look, there you see. It's automatically got triggered. If I go in here, yep, second job that gets triggered automatically. You know, it was triggered at 42, 1642, which is 442 my time. That looks good. And if everything goes well, every one minute onwards, this job would be automatically triggered. Now that I have uh, my Jenkins up and running, a few jobs that has been put up here on my Jenkins instance, I would need a way of controlling access to my Jenkins server. This is wherein I would use a plugin called Role Based Access Plugin and create few rules. The rules are something like a global role and a project role, project specific role. I can have different roles and I can have users who have signed up or the users whom I create kind of assigned to these roles so that each of these users fall into some category. This is my way of kind of controlling access to my Jenkins instance and uh, ensuring that people don't do something unwarranted. All right, so first things first, let me go ahead and uh, install a plugin for doing that. So I get into manage Jenkins and uh, manage plugin. A little bit of a confusing screen in my opinion. There's updates available, installed in advanced. As of now, we don't have the role based plugin. So let me go to available. It'll take some time for it to get refreshed. All right. Now, these are the available plugins. These are the installed plugins. All right. So let me come back to available. And I would want to search for my role based access plugin. So I would just search for role and hit enter. Okay. Role based authorization strategy enables user authorization using a role based strategy roles can be defined globally or for particular jobs or nodes and stuff like that so exactly this is the plugin that i want i would want to install it without a restart all right looks good so far yes go back to the top of the page yes and remember jenkins is running on a java using a java instance so typically many things would work the same way unless and until you want to restart Jenkins once in a while. But as a good practice, whenever you do some sort of a big installations or big patches on your Jenkins instance, just ensure that you kind of restart it. Otherwise, there would be a difference in terms of what is installed on the system and what is there on the file system. You would need to flush out few of those settings later on. But for now, these are all very small plugins. So these would run without any problems. But otherwise, if at all there are some plugins, which would need a restart, you know, kindly go ahead and restart uh, your Jenkins instance. But for now, I don't need that. It looks good. I've installed the plugin. So where do I see my plugin? I installed the plugin that is specific to the user control or the access control. So let me go into, yes, global security. And uh, I would see this role based strategy showing up now. All right. So this comes in because of my installation of my role based uh, plugin. So this is what I would want to enable because I already have my uh, own database set up and for the authorization part in the sense that who can do what I'm going to install. I mean, I've already installed a role based strategy uh, plugin and I'm going to enable that strategy. All right. I would say save. Okay. Now I've installed the role based access plugin. I would need to just set it up and check that, you know, I would go ahead and create some roles and ensure that I assign users as per these roles. All right, so let me go to manage Jenkins, configure. All right, let me see where is this configure, configure global security. Is that where I create my roles? Nope, not here. Yes, manage and assign roles. Okay, again, you would see these options only after you install these plugins. 
So for now, I've just enabled the plugin. I've enabled role-based access control, and I would go ahead and create some rules for this particular Jenkins instance. So I would say first, manage rules. So I would need to create some rules here, and the rules are at a very high level. These are global rules, and there are some project rules, and there are some slave rules. I'll not get into details of all of these at a very, very high level, which is a global role. Let me just create a role. A role can be kind of visualized like a group. So I would create a role called developer. Typically, the Jenkins instance or the CA instance are kind of owned up or controlled by QA guys. So QA guys would need to provide some sort of, a, you know, limited access to developers. So that's why I'm creating a role called developer. And I'm adding this role at a global role level. So I would say add this here. And you would see this developer role that is there. And each of these options, if you hover over it, you would see some sort of a help on what what are these uh, you know permissions specific to so what i want is like you know it sounds a little you know different but i would want to give very very little permissions for the developer so from an administration perspective i would just want him to have a read uh, kind of a role credentials again i would just want a view kind of a role i don't want him to create any agents and all that stuff that looks good for me for a job i would want him to just possibly uh, read I don't want him to build. I don't want him to cancel any jobs. I don't want him to configure any job. I don't even want him to create any job. I would just want him to read few things. I would not give him possibly a role to the workspace as well. I mean, I don't want him to have access to the workspace. I would just want him to uh, read a job or check, you know, have read-only access to the job. Run. Um, no, I don't want him to give him any, any particular access which will allow him to run any jobs. View, configure. Yeah, possibly create, yeah, delete, I don't want, read, yes, definitely. And this is the specific role. So what I'm doing, I'm just creating a global role called developer and I'm giving him very, very limited roles in the sense that I don't want this developer to be able to run any agents, nor create jobs or build jobs or cancel jobs or configure jobs. At the max, I would just want him to read a job that is already put up there. Okay. So I would save. Now I've created a role. I still don't have any users that is there on the system. So let me go ahead and create some user on the system. That's not here. I would say configure, manage Jenkins, manage users. Okay, let me create a new user. I would call this user as, yeah, developer one sounds good. Some password some password that i can remember okay his name is developer1 d at d dot com or something like that okay so this is the admin with with which i kind of configure or brought up the system and developer1 is a user that i have configured so still have not set any rules for this particular user yet so i would go to manage jenkins i would say manage and assign roles I would say assign roles okay so if you see what I'm going to do now is assign a role that is specific to that particular developer I will find the particular user and assign him the developer role that I have already configured the role shows up here I would need to find my user who I created and then assign him to that particular role so if you remember the user that I created was uh, developer one I would add this particular user and now this particular user what kind of a role i want him to have because this is the global role that i had created so developer i would assign this developer one to this particular global role and i would go ahead and save my changes now let me check the permissions of this particular user by logging out of my admin account and logging back as a developer one if you remember this role was created with very less privileges. So there you go. I have Jenkins, but I don't see a new item. I can't trigger a new job. I can't do anything. I see these jobs. However, I don't think so I'll be able to start this job. I don't have the permission set for that. The maximum I can do is look at the job, see what was there as a part of the console output and stuff like that. So this is a limited role that was created. And I added this developer to that particular role, which was a developer role so that the developers don't get to configure any of the jobs because the Jenkins instance is owned by a QA person. 
he doesn't want to give developer any administrative rights so the rights that he set out by creating a developer role and anybody who is tagged any user who is tagged as a part of this developer role would get the same kind of permissions and these permissions can be you know fine grain it can be a project specific permissions as well but for now i just demonstrated the high level permission that i had set in let me quickly log out of this user and get back as the admin user because i need to continue with my demo with the developer role that was created i have very very less privileges one of the reasons for jenkins being so popular as i mentioned earlier is the bunch of plugins that is provided by users or community users who don't charge any money for these plugins but it's got plugins for connecting anything and everything so if you can navigate to or if you can find jenkins plugins you would see index of over so many plugins that is there all of these are wonderful plugins whatever connectors that you would need if you want to connect jenkins to an aws instance or you want to connect jenkins to a docker instance or any of those containers you would have a plugin you can go and search up if i want to connect jenkins to bitbucket bitbucket is one of the git servers There's so many plugins that is available okay so bottom line jenkins without plugins is nothing so plugins is the heart of jenkins for you to connect or for in order to connect jenkins with any of the containers or any of the other tool sets you would need the plugins if you want to connect or you want to build a repository which has got java and maven you would need to install maven and jdk on your jenkins instance if at all you're looking for a dotnet build or a microsoft build you would need to have ms build installed on your on your jenkins instance and the plugins that will trigger ms build if at all you want to listen to some server side web hooks from github you would need github specific plugins if you want to connect jenkins to aws you need those plugins if you want to connect to a docker instance that is running anywhere in the world as long as you have the url which is publicly reachable you just have a docker plugin that is installed on your jenkins instance sonar cube is one of the popular static code analyzers so you can connect a jenkins build you can build a job on jenkins and push it to sonar cube and get sonar cube to run analysis on that and get back the results in jenkins all of these works very well because of the plugins now with that let me connect our jenkins instance to github i already have a very very simple uh, java repository up on my github instance so let me connect jenkins to this particular github instance and pull out a job that is put up there all right so this is my very very simple uh, you know repository that is there called hello java and this is what is there in the repo there is a hello hello.java application that is here or a simple class file that is there it's got just one line of system.out so this is already present on github.com at this place and this would be the url for this uh, repository if i pick up the https url this is my https url so what i would do is i would connect my jenkins instance to go to github provide my credentials and pull out this repository which is on the cloud hosted github.com and get it to my jenkins instance and then build this particular java file i'm keeping the source code very very simple it's just a java file how do i build my java file how do i compile my java file i just say java c and the name of my uh, class file which is hello.java and how do i run my java file i would say java and hello okay so remember i don't need to install any plugins now because uh, what it needs is a git plugin so if you remember when we were doing the installation there was a bunch of recommended plugins so git is already uh, installed on my system so i don't need to install it again so let me put up a new job here it says uh, git job let it be a freestyle project that's good for me i would say okay all right so the source code management remember in the earlier examples we did not use any source code because we were just putting up some echo kind of a uh, jobs we did not need any integration with any of the source code systems so now let me connect this so i'm going to put up a source code and git would show up because the plugin is already there svn perforce any of those additional um, source code management tools if at all you would need just install those plugins and jenkins connects wonderfully well to all these particular source control tools okay so i would copy the https url from here i would say this is the url that i'm supposed to go and grab my source code from but all right that sounds good but what is the username and password so i'll have to specify a username and password all right so i would say the username this is my username and uh, this is my https credential for my job 
okay so this is my username and this is my password i just save this i say add and then i would say you know use this credentials to go to github and then on my behalf pull out a repository all right if at all at this stage if there's any error in terms of not able to jenkins not able to find git or the git.exe or if my credentials are wrong somewhere down here you would see a red message saying that you know something is not right you can just go ahead and kind of fix that for now this looks good for me i'm going to grab this url what am i going to do this step would pull the source code from the github and then what would be there as a part of my build step because this repository just has a java file correct hello.java so in order to for me to build this i would just say execute windows batch command and i would say java c hello.java that is the way i would build my uh, java code and if i have to run it I would just say Java hello pretty simple two steps and this would run after the repository contents are fetched from github so Java C Java that sounds good I would say save this and let me try to run this okay if you see there's a lot of you know it executes git on your behalf it goes out here it provides my credentials and says you know it pulls all my repository and by default it will pull up the master branch that is there on my repository and it kind of builds this whole thing java c hello to java and it runs this project java hello and there you see this is the output that is there and if at all you want to look at the contents of the repository if you can go here this is my workspace of my system hang on this is not right okay get job if you see here this is my hello.java this is the same program that was there on my github repository okay so this is a program that was there on the github repository all right so this was the same program that was here and jenkins on our behalf went over all the way to github pulled this repository from there and then you know it, it brought it down to my local system on my jenkins instance it compiled it and it ran this particular application Okay, now that I've integrated Jenkins successfully with GitHub for a simple Java application, let me build a little bit on top of it. What I will do is I have a Maven based web application that is up there as a repository in my GitHub. So this is the repository that I'm talking about. It's called MVN Web App. It's got, it's a Maven based uh, repository. As you would know, Maven is a very, very simple uh, Java based uh, build tool that will allow you to run various targets and it'll compile it will based upon the goals that you specify it can compile it can run some tests and it can it can build a war file and even deploy it into some other server for now what we're going to use maven is just for building and creating a package out of this particular web application it contains a bunch of things and uh, what is important is just the index.jsp it just contains an html file that is there as a part of this web application so from a perspective of requirements now since i'm going to connect jenkins with this particular repository git we already have that set we only need two other things one is maven because jenkins will use maven so in order to use maven jenkins would have to have a maven installation that is there on the jenkins box and in this case the jenkins box is this laptop and after i have my maven installed i also need a tomcat server tomcat is a very very simple uh, web server uh, that you can freely download I'll let you know how to quickly uh, download and install the Tomcat. All right. So download Maven first. There are various ways in which you can kind of download this Maven. There is zip files, binary zip files and archive files. So what I've done is I've just already downloaded Maven. And if you see, I've unzipped it here. So this is the folder with which I have unzipped my Maven. So as you know, Maven again is, is a one open source uh, build tool. So you'll have to set in a few configurations and set up the path. So MVN hyphen hyphen version, if I specify this, after I set in my path, Maven should work. And if at all, I echo M2 home, which is nothing but the variable environment variable specific to Maven home, it is already set here. So once you unzip Maven, just set this M2 home variable to the directory where you unzipped your Maven. Also, just set the path to this particular directory slash bin because that is where your maven executables are all found all right so that's with maven and you know since i've set the path and the environment variable maven is running 
perfectly fine on my system. I've just verified it. Okay, next one is a Tomcat server. Download Apache Tomcat server 8.5 is what I have on my system. So I'm just going to show you where to download this from. This is where you download Tomcat server. And um, I already have the server downloaded. Again, this doesn't need any installation. I just unzip it here and it kind of has a bin and configuration. I've made some subtle changes in the configuration. First and foremost, Tomcat server also by default runs on port 8080. Since we already have our uh, Jenkins server running on port 8080, we cannot let Tomcat run on the same uh, port. There will be a port clash. So what I've done, I've configured Tomcat to use a different port. So if I go to this configuration file here, there is a server.xml. Let me open this up here. All right. Okay. So this is the port. By default, it will be 8080. I've just modified it to 8081. So I've changed the port on which my Tomcat server would run. All right. So that is one chain. Second change. When Jenkins kind of tries to get into my Tomcat and deploy something for someone, he would need some authentications so that he'll be allowed deployment by Tomcat. So for that, I need to create a user on Tomcat and provide this user credentials to my Jenkins instance. So I would go to Tomcat users.xml file here. I've already created a username called deployer and the password is deployer and I've added a role called manager hyphen script. Manager hyphen script will allow programmatic access to the Tomcat server. So this is the role that is there. So using this credentials, I will enable or I'll empower Jenkins to get into my Tomcat server and deploy my application. All right, only these two things that is required. Let me just start my Tomcat server first. So I get into my bin folder. I open a command prompt here and there's a startup.bat. It's pretty fast. It just takes a few seconds. Yes, there you go. Tomcat server is up and running. Now this is running on port 8081. So let me just check if that looks good. So localhost. 8081. Okay, my Tomcat server is up and running. That sounds good. The user is already configured on this. That's also fine. So what I'll do as a part of my first job, Maven is also installed on my system. So I'm good to use Maven as a part of my Jenkins. So I will put up a simple job now. I will say job MVN web app. I'll call this freestyle job. That's good. Okay, so this will be a Git repository. What is the URL of my Git repository? Is uh, this guy HTTPS URL? Okay, that's this URL. I will use the credentials. The old credential that I set up will work well because it's the same Git user that I'm kind of connecting into. All right, so now the change happens here where I, after I get this, since I said this is a simple Maven repository, I will have some Maven targets to run. So the simple target first is let me run Maven package. This creates a war file. Okay, so MVN package is the uh, target. Package is the target. So when whenever I run this package, it kind of creates it, it builds it, it tests it, and then creates a package. So this is all that is required. Maybe let me try to save this, and uh, let me first run this and see if it connects well. If there's any problem with my war file or the war file gets created properly. Okay, wonderful. So it built a war file and if you see it all shows you what is the location where this war file was generated. So this will be the workspace. If you see this, this war file was successfully built. Now I need to grab this particular war file and then I would need to deploy it into Tomcat server. Again, I would need a small plugin to do this because I need to connect Tomcat with my Jenkins server. Let me go ahead and um, install the plugin for the container deployment. So I would go to manage plugins, available, type in container, Container, container. 
deploy to container okay so this would this the plugin that i would need i would install it without a restart okay seems to be very fast nope sorry it's still installing okay it installed the plugin so if at all you see this if you go to my workspace okay in the target folder i would see this web application war file that is already built so i would need to configure this plugin to pull up this war file and deploy it onto the tomcat server for deploying onto the tomcat server i will use the credentials of the user that i've created okay so let me go to configure this particular project again and um okay all this is good so the package is good i'm going to just create a package that's all fine now add a post build step so after the war file is built as a part of this package uh, directive let me use this deployment to container now this will show up after you install the plugin so deploy this one to the container now what is that you're supposed to specify you're supposed to specify so what is the location okay so this is a global uh, you know configuration that is there that will allow you to from the root folder it will pick up the war file that is there so star star forward slash star dot war that's good for me okay what is the context path context path is nothing but just the name of an application that you know under which it will get deployed into the tomcat server i will just say mvn web app that's the name of my thing now I need to specify what kind of a container that I'm talking about. All right, so the deployment would be for this Tomcat 8.5 is what I need. Okay, because the server that we have is a Tomcat 8.5 server that I have. So this would be the URL. So the credentials, yes, I need to add a credential for this particular server. So if you remember, I had created a credential for my web application. So let me just find that my tomcat server yes configuration of this okay so deployer and deployer username is deployer password is deployer okay so let me use that credential i would say i would say add a new credential jenkins credential the username is deployer and the password is deployer so i would use this deployer credentials for that and what is the url of my tomcat instance so this is the url of my tomcat instance so take the war file that is fine found in this particular folder and then you know context path is mn web app use the deployer deployment credentials and get into this localhost which is there 8081 this is the tomcat server that is running on my system and then go ahead and deploy it okay so that is all that is required so i would say just save this and uh, let me run it now okay it built successfully built the war file it is trying to deploy it and uh, looks like the deployment went ahead perfectly well so the context path was mvn web app so if i type in this if at all i go ahead into my uh, tomcat server there would be a web apps folder you would see the you know the date timestamp so this is the file that get got recently copied and this is the explorer version of our application so the application was built the source code of this application was pulled from the github server it was built locally on the uh, jenkins instance and then it was pushed into a tomcat server which is running on a different port which is 8081 now for this demo i'm running everything locally on my system but assuming that you know this particular tomcat instance was running on some other server with some other different ip address all that you got to go and change is the url of the server so this would be the server in case you you already have that uh, you know if you have a tomcat server which is running on some other machine that's all fine with a different ip that's all good enough the whole bundle or the war file that was built as a part of this Jenkins job gets transferred onto the other server and gets deployed. That's the beauty of uh, Jenkins and automatic deployments or other deployments using Jenkins and Maven. Distributed build or uh, master slave configuration in Jenkins. 
as you would have seen you know we just have one instance of jenkins server up and running all the time and also i told you that whenever any job that kind of you know gets started on the jenkins server it is little heavy on, on in terms of disk space and the cpu utilization so which kind of you know if at all you're in an organization wherein you're heavily reliant on um, the jenkins server you don't want your jenkins server to go down so that's wherein you kind of start distributing the load that is there on the jenkins server so you primarily have a server which is just a placeholder or like a master who will take in all the kind of jobs and what he'll do is based upon trigger that has happened to the job or whichever job needs to be built he if at all he can delegate these jobs onto some other machines or some other slaves you know that's a wonderful thing to have okay use case one use case two assuming that you know if you have a jenkins server that is running on a windows box or on a linux one and if at all you have a need where you need to build based upon operating systems you have multiple build configurations to support maybe you need to build a windows uh, you know windows based .NET kind of a projects where you would need a windows uh, machine to build this particular project you also have a requirement where you want to build linux linux based uh, systems you also have a mac you you support some sort of an apps or something that is built on mac os you would need to build you know mac based system as well so how are you going to support all these needs so that's wherein a beautiful concept of master slave or you know primary and delegations or agent and master comes into play so typically you would have one jenkins server who will just you know configure with all the proper authorizations users configurations and everything is set up on this jenkins server his job is just delegations he will listen to some sort of triggers or based upon the job that is coming in he will if there is a way nice way of delegating these jobs to somebody else and you know taking back the results he can control a lot of other systems and these systems may not have a complete or there's no need to put in a complete jenkins installation all that you got to do is have a very very simple runner or a slave that is a simple jar file that is run as a low priority thread or a process within these systems so with that you can have a wonderful distributed build server that can be set up and in case one of the servers goes down your master would know that what went down and kind of delegate the task to somebody else so this is the kind of distributed build or the master slave configuration so what i'll do in this exercise or in this demo is i will set up a simple slave but since i don't have too many machines to kind of play around what i'll do is i will set up a slave in in one other folder within my hard drive so i've got the c drive and d drive my jenkins is on my c drive so what i do is i would just use my e drive and set up a very very simple uh, slave out there i'll just show you how to provision a slave and how to connect to a slave and how to delegate a job to that slave let me go back to my Jenkins uh, master and uh, configure him to, you know, talk to an agent. So there are various ways in which this client and server talk to each other. What I'm going to choose is something called as JNLP, Java Network Launch Protocol. So using this, I would ensure that, you know, the client and server talk to each other. So for that, I need to ensure that I kind of enable this JNLP port. So let me try to find out where is that. Let me try this. Okay, yes agents and uh, by default this jnlp agents uh, thing would be disabled so if you see here there's a small help on this so i'm going to use this jnlp which is nothing but uh, java network launch protocol and you know i'll configure the master and server to talk to each other using jnlp so for that i need to enable this guy so i enable this guy instead of making the by default the configuration was disabled so i make him random i make him you know enabled and i say save this configuration all right so now i configured or i made a setting for the master so that the jnlp uh, port is kind of opened up so let me go ahead and um, you know create an agent so i'll go to manage nodes so if you see here there's only one master here so let me provision a new node here so this is the way you know in which you bring up a new node you have to configure it on the server uh, jenkins would put in some sort of uh, security around this particular uh, agent and let you know how to launch this particular agent so that he can connect to our Jenkins master. So I would say new node. I would give a name for my node. I would say Windows node because both of these are Windows only. So that's fine. I just give an identifier saying that Windows node. I would say this is a permanent agent. I would say, okay. So if you see the name, let me just copy this name here with the description. Number of executors. Since it's a slave node and both of these are running on my system, I will keep the number of executors as one that's fine remote root directory now this is where let me just clarify this since i have both my my master is running on my c drive c drive program files 86 
or hang on not 86 c colon program files it is indeed 86 all right jenkins so this is where my master is running so i don't want the c drive what i'll do is i'll use something called as a drive i have another drive in my system but please visualize this like you know you're running this on a separate system altogether so i create a folder here called jenkins node and this is where i'm going to place my or i'm going to provision my slave and i'm going to run him from here so this is the directory in which i'm going to provision my slave node so i'm going to copy this here and that is the remote root directory of your particular agent or slave so i just copy it here the label you know probably this is fine for me and usage how do you want to use this guy so i would don't want him to run all kinds of jobs i will only build jobs with label expressions that match this particular node and so this is the label of this node so in order for somebody to kind of delegate any task to them they will have to specify this particular label so imagine this way if i have a bunch of windows mesh system i name it as windows star anything that starts from windows i can give a regular expression and say that anything that matches windows run this particular task there if i have some mac machines i name all these mac agents as uh, mac star or something like that and i can delegate all tasks you know saying that start with whatever starts with mac in this node run the mac jobs there so you identify a node using the label and then delegate the task there all right so launch method you know we will use java web star because we got to we we got to use jnlp protocol okay that sounds good directory i think nothing else is required availability yes we'll keep this agent yep online as much as possible that sounds good all right let me save this all right i'm just provisioning this particular node now so if i click on this node i get a bunch of commands along with an agent or jar so this is the agent or jar that has to be taken down to the other machine or the slave node and from there i need to run this along with a small security credential so let me copy this whole text here in my notepad notepad plus plus is good for me okay i copy this whole path there i also want to download this agent.jar i would say yes and this agent.jar is the one that is configured by our server so all the details that is required for launching this agent.jar is found in this uh, sorry for launching this agent is found in this agent.jar so typically i need to take this jar file onto the other system and then kind of run it from there so i have this agent.jar i copy this or rather i cut this i come back to my folder my jenkins node i paste it here okay so now with this provision agent dot jar and i need to use this whole command control a control c and then launch this particular agent so let me bring up a command prompt right here and then launch it so i'm saying in the same folder where there is agent dot jar i'm going to launch this a particular agent java hyphen jar agent dot jar jnlp this is the url of my server in case the server and client are on different locations or different ips let us specify the ip address all this anyway would show up and then the secret and you know the root folder of your jenkins or the slave node okay so something ran and then you know it says it's connected very well it seems to have connected very well so let me come back to my jenkins instance and see you know if at all you see earlier this was not connected now let me refresh this guy okay now these two guys are connected provision a jenkins node and then i copied all the credentials of the slave.jar along with the launch code and then took it to the other system and kind of ran it from there since i don't have another system i've just got a separate directory in another folder another drive and i'm launching the agent from here as long as this particular agent is up and running or this command prompt is up and running the agent would be connected so once i close this the connection goes down all right so successfully you've launched this particular agent now this would be the home directory of this jenkins node or the jenkins slave so any task that i'm going to delegate to this particular slave would all be run here it will create a workspace right here all right so good so let me just come back and let me kind of put up a new task here 
I will say that, you know, delegate job is good. I say freestyle project. I'm going to create a very, very simple job here. I don't want it to connect to gate or anything like that. Let me just create a very, very simple echo delegated to the slave delegated to I don't like the word slave delegated to agent put this way all right so delegated to agent sounds good now how am I going to ensure that this particular job runs on the agent or on the slave that I have configured right do you see this if at all you remember how we provisioned our particular slave we give a label right so now I'm going to put in a job that will only match this particular label. So I'm going to say that whatever matches this, you know, Windows label, run this job on that particular node. So we have only one node that's matching this, you know, Windows node. So this job will be delegated out there. So I save this and uh, let me build this. This is again a very, very simple job. There's nothing in this. I just want to demonstrate how to kind of delegate it to an agent. So if you see this, it ran successfully. And uh, where is the workspace? The workspace is right inside our Jenkins node. It created a new workspace, delegated job, it put in here. So my old or the, my uh, primary master uh, job is in SQL uh, program files under Jenkins. And this is the slave job that was successfully run. Very, very simple, but very, very powerful concept of master slave configuration or distributed build in Jenkins. Okay, approaching the final section where um, we've done all this hard work in bringing up our Jenkins server, configuring it, putting up some jobs on it, creating users and all this stuff. Now, we don't want this configuration to kind of go away. We want a very nice way of ensuring that we back up all this configuration. And in case there is any failure, hardware crash or a machine crash, we would want to kind of restore from the uh, existing configuration that we kind of backed up. So one quick way to do that would be, or one dirty way to do that would be just, you know, take a complete backup of our C colon program files colon Jenkins directory because that's where our whole Jenkins configuration is present. But we would, don't want to do that. Let's use some plugins for uh, taking up a backup. So let me go to manage Jenkins and uh, click on available. And uh, let me search for some back. There are a bunch of backup plugins. So I would recommend one of these plugins that I specifically use. So this is the backup plugin. So let me go ahead and install this plugin. All right, so we went ahead and installed this plugin. So let me come back to my manage plugins. So this plugin is there. So hang on, backup manager. So you will see this option once you install this plugin. So first time I can, you know, do a setup. I would say back up this particular, I'll give a folder. Uh, this folder is pertaining to the folder where I want Jenkins to back up some data. And I would say the format should be zip format is good enough. Uh, let me give a name or a template or a file name for my, uh, you know, backup. This is good. I want it in verbose mode. I don't want to shut on my Jenkins or should I shut it down? No. Okay. One thing that you got to remember is that whenever a backup happens, if there are too many jobs that is running on the server, it can kind of slow down your um, Jenkins instance because it's it's in the process of copying few of those things and if the files are being changed at that moment, it's a little bit problematic for Jenkins. So typically you back up your servers only when there is very less load or typically try to, you know, bring it to a shutdown kind of a state and then take a backup. All right, so I'm going to back up all these things. You know, I don't want to exclude anything else. I want the history. I want the Maven artifacts. Possibly I don't want this guy. I would just say save and then I would say back him up. So this would run a bunch of, you know, steps and all the files that is required as a part of this is pretty fast. But then if at all you have too many things up on your server for now, we didn't have too many things up on our server. But in case you had too many things to kind of back up, this may take a while. So let me just pause this recording and get back to you once the uh, backup is complete. So there you go. The backup was successful, created a backup of all our workspace, the configurations, the users, and you know, all that. So all this is kind of hidden down in this particular zip file. So at any instance, if at all, I kind of crash my system for some instance or say hard disk failure, 
and I bring up a new instance of Jenkins, I can kind of use the backup plugin for restoring this particular configurations. So how do I do that? I just come back to my manage Jenkins, come back to backup manager, and I will say restore Hudson or Jenkins configuration. Simply Learn's postgraduate program in DevOps with Caltech University in collaboration with IBM should be your right choice. For more details on this program, please use the link in the description box below. Let's get started with what is JMeter. JMeter or Apache JMeter is an open source software which is a 100% pure Java application. The application is designed to load or test functional behavior and measure performance. Performance testing means testing a web application against heavy load, multiple and concurrent user traffic. It was originally designed for testing web applications but has since expanded to other test functions. To simplify, let's assume that someday your team lead tells you to perform performance testing of some website like google.com or facebook.com for around 100 users. What would be the first thing that comes to your mind? Do you think it's practically possible to arrange 100 people with computers and access to the internet and accessing the same website? Now just imagine the infrastructure requirement when this testing has to be done for 1000 or 10,000 users. This is when a need for software like JMeter arises. So what JMeter actually does is that it simulates. It will simulate real user behaviors and perform load tests on a server, group of servers, network or object. Moving further, let's have a look at the prerequisites to install JMeter. The only prerequisite of installing JMeter is that Java must be installed in your system. Since JMeter is an entirely based application, that's why having Java installed in your system is a must. Other than that, JMeter can be used in many operating systems such as Linux, Windows, Mac US or even Ubuntu. Now that we know the basics of JMeter, let's go on to installing JMeter onto our system. First, let's check if you have Java installed in your system. For checking that, we shall go to the command prompt and type java hyphen version. We can see that Java is present in our system. Here, it will show the version of Java present in our system. The next step is to download JMeter. Go to Google Chrome and type JMeter download. Now go to the official Apache JMeter website and go to the binary sections. In the binary sections, we shall download the zip folder. Once the zip folder is downloaded, open the folder location, then extract the zip folder. Once the folder is again extracted, go inside the folder and go inside the bin folder here. The bin folder contains the JMeter script file for starting JMeter. Now it's time for us to launch JMeter. But before we launch JMeter, we need to know that there are typically two types of modes in which JMeter can be launched, the GUI mode and the non-GUI mode. The non-GUI mode may refer to two types, the first being running JMeter in the server mode and the second refers to running JMeter in the command line. And if we talk about the GUI mode, then the GUI mode has a limitation which slows down the CPU utilization while running the recorded script. But GUI mode of JMeter is perfect for adding and editing new configuration elements, thread groups and samplers as a result of which you can view a number of different listeners helping for debugging. Here today we shall be using the GUI mode. So to open the GUI mode inside this bin folder select the jmeter.bat file. Double click on this file. This may take a while and then the jmeter window will open up on the screen. The home window is divided into two sections. On the left side, all the elements of the test plan are added and on the right side, all the configuration of that element are added. As we see on the test plan element, we can see the configurations of the same. Here, the test plan is like a place or a container where all the elements we will use to perform this test will be stored. All the requests, listeners and everything will be stored here. So, moving forward, let's rename this test plan. Let's name the test plan to be first JMeter. Now, when you click outside this window section, you can see the element name will change. Otherwise, you can just save this and also the name will change. 
Now, when this is done, the next step is to add thread groups. Right click on first J meter here and select the add option. Then in this option, select the threads option and then threads group. The thread group refers to the users that are used or created or needed to run this test. So let's name this thread group to be J meter. It has several different options like the action to be taken after there is an error, you can choose it in the way you want. Then there is this number of threads where you can choose the number of users you want. Then there is a ramp up period in seconds option that states the time gap between the users hits. Third, there is also a loop count where you can choose how many times the test will run for the number of users. You can choose the test to run infinite number of times. There is also a scheduler here that will help you schedule the start time and the test's end time. For now, let's leave everything to be one only. The next step is to go to first J meter and again to go to add. In the box that appears, select samplers. You can see all types of requests that J meter can work on. For now, we will choose the simplest of them all. Let's choose the HTTP request. Here, you will have to give the address to some home pages or websites. So let's make it a little easy. Let's rename it to be home pages. Here in the server name or IP box, we have to give the server name or the IP. Let's pick a website. Let's go to the Simply Learn website. Copy the URL from here. Come back to the JMeter window and paste it in the server name box. Keep in mind we don't need to give HTTP or HTTPS since these are protocols which will come in the other box and they will be automatically taken in the HTTP request case. Then in the path dialog box, since we have to access the route page, we will leave a forward slash there. Now when our HTTP test is ready, we will perform the test on it. To determine what the result of the test will be, we need to add some more test elements. We shall again right click on first J meter, go to the listener options. Then in the box we can check the different type of reports that JMeter provides us. For now we shall select two of these. Let's choose view results in table and the view results tree. Now save the test and run it. For running the test there are three simple ways. First you can simply click the green button here to run. Second, you can go to this run option and choose run the test. And the third way is you can right click on first J meter and choose to run. Let's simply choose the green button and run the test. After we run the test, we shall go to check the results of the test. Since we had put the number of threads and loop to be one, there's just one entry in both the results. Now let's try one more thing. We shall go to JMeter and change the number of threads and the loop count. Let's make the number of threads to be around 10 and also the loop count to be 10. And now run the test. After running the test, we shall see the results in the table and see the testing being performed. And the same happens in the case of view results in tree. Since we have increased the number of users and the loop count, we can see the test being performed accordingly. Since the loop count now was 10, so for each user, the test will run 10 times. And here on the screen, we can see the time taken and the number of tests being performed and the status of each hit onto our website link. Let's get started with what is performance testing. So performance testing is one of the most important phases of any product launch as it verifies and validates the overall product performance. This testing can be done in different forms depending upon the resource availability and the type and volume of the user base. The main agenda behind conducting performance testing on any product is to make sure that the product's performance is as expected before it gets launched into the market. So, performance testing is the process of testing a software application under a specific workload. Performance testing is a software testing process used to test the speed, response time, stability, reliability, scalability and resource usage of a software application under a particular workload. The main purpose of performance testing is to identify and eliminate performance bottlenecks in the software application. 
Performance testing mainly focuses on three factors of a software program. First one is the speed. Here it identifies whether the response of the application is fast or not. Then comes scalability where the maximum user load is determined and the third one is stability where the stability of the application is checked under various workloads. Now we know what is performance testing. Let us understand why we need performance testing. The only concern of a software system is not features and functionality. The response time, reliability, resource and scalability are also important factors. So, the goal of performance testing is not to find bugs but to eliminate performance glitches. Performance testing is performed to help the stakeholders with information about the application concerning the application speed, stability and scalability. Furthermore, performance testing reveals what needs to be improved before the product goes into the market. If there is no performance testing, the software might suffer from issues such as running slow while several users use it simultaneously, inconsistencies across different operating systems and poor usability. Performance testing determines if the software or application meets speed, scalability and stability requirements under expected workloads. Applications sent to market with poor performance metrics due to non-consistent or poor performance testing are likely to bring a bad reputation and fail to meet the expected sales goals. Now we know the relevance and need for performance testing. Let's look at the types of performance testing. So there are six types of performance testing namely load testing, stress testing, volume testing, capacity testing, reliability testing and scalability testing. Let's have a look at all the six types of testing one after the other. So the first type is load testing. Load testing is a type of performance testing where the application is tested for its performance on normal and peak usage. An application's performance is checked concerning its response to the user request and its availability to respond consistently within accepted endurance on different user loads. Here, the main consideration is the maximum load the application can hold before the application starts behaving abruptly. Then, another consideration is regarding how much data the database can handle before the system crashes. The second type of performance testing is stress testing. Stress testing is a type in which different ways to break the system are found, that is, how much load a system can sustain. Stress testing has an incremental approach where the load is increased gradually. The test is started with a load for which the application has already been tested. Then, more load is added slowly to stress the system. The point at which we start seeing servers not responding to the request is considered the breaking point. Here, the major considerations are the maximum load to a system can sustain before it breaks down. Then, how is the system broken down? And how will the system be able to recover once it has crashed? We also see in how many ways a system can break and which are the weak nodes that are to be kept in mind while handling the unexpected load. Moving forth, the next type is volume testing. Volume testing is the type where the performance of the system is checked with respect to the volume of the data. To execute a volume test, a huge volume of data is entered into the database. This test can be incremental or steady test. In the incremental test, the volume of the data is increased gradually. Generally, with the application usage, the database size grows and it is necessary to test the application against a heavy database. If we consider an example, Let's say there is a website of college having small amounts of data to store initially. But after 5 to 10 years, the data stored in the database of the website is much more and has become huge. Now comes the fourth type of performance testing, the capacity testing. So capacity testing is a type of testing where the application is checked for its capability to meet the business volumes. Capacity testing is generally done for future prospects. Here, the main concerns are if the application would be able to support the future load, if the environment is capable of standing the upcoming increased load, and what are the additional resources required to make the environment capable enough. Capacity testing helps in determining how many users or transactions of a given web application is capable of supporting and will perform well. During this testing, resources such as processor capacity, network bandwidth, memory usage, disk capacity, etc. are considered and altered to meet the goal. 
To consider an excellent example of capacity testing, we can see the case of online banking. Moving forward, the next type of testing is the reliability testing. Reliability testing is a type in which the application is verified if the application would be normal again after an abnormal state. It estimates the time that the system would take to return to its normal state to understand the concept. Let's say there is an online trading site that experiences some failure and because of which the users are not able to buy or sell shares at a certain point of the day. But after a couple of hours, they were able to operate their shares and the application became normal. This is when it can be said that the application is reliable and can recover from its abnormal state. The last type of testing is scalability testing. Scalability testing is a type where the application is determined if it would be able to scale up whenever needed. The need for scaling up comes when there is an increase in user load. Now when we have learned the types of performance testing, we must learn the process of performance testing. So the process of performance testing is divided into eight parts. That is requirement gathering, selection of tools, performance test plan, performance test development, performance test modeling, execution of test, test result analysis, report. Now let's have a look at all of these processes one after the other. The first step in the process is requirement gathering. The requirements are identified and gathered from the clients by the performance team. This includes getting information on the application's architecture, technologies, database used, intended users, functionality, application usage, test requirement, hardware and software requirements, etc. The second step in the process is selection of tools. After the previous step, POC or proof of concept is done with the available tools. The proof of concept is a sort of demonstration of real-time activity but in a limited sense. The list of available tools depends on the tool's cost, the protocol that the application is using, the technologies used to build the application, the number of users we were simulating for the test, etc. Now the third step. The third step is the performance test plan. In reference to the above two steps, test planning and designing are conducted. The process of test planning involves information on how the performance test is going to take place, like the test environment, workload, hardware, etc. Moving forth, the fourth step is performance test development. In this step, the use cases for the identified functionalities are created. These use cases are shared with the client for their approval. Once the clients approve the use case, the script development begins. These scripts are validated against several different users and parallel to script creation. The performance team sets up the test environment. The performance team also takes care of metadata through scripts if the client does not take up that activity. So the next step is performance test modeling. Performance load model is created for the test execution. This step aims to validate whether the given performance metrics are achieved during the test or not. Then the sixth step is execution of tests. The scenario is designed according to the load model in controller or performance center. Initially, the tests are not executed with maximum users that are in the load model. The test execution is done in incremental order. Let's say there are 1000 users, then the scenario will begin testing from 100 then go to 250, then 350 and so on. It will gradually increase and go up to 1000 users. The next step is the seventh step in our process. That is the test result analysis. The test results are the most important deliverable for the performance tester. This is where we can prove the return on investment and productivity that a performance testing effort can provide. What makes the result analysis process more effective is that we must have a unique and meaningful name for every test result, which will help us understand the test purpose. In the test summary, certain things must be included like the reason for failure, how the performance of the application changes regarding the previous runs. It is also a good practice to make a result summary after each test run so that the analysis results are not compiled every single time the results are referred. Then the final and the last step in performance testing process is the report. The test results should be simplified so that conclusion is clearer and should not create any derivation. The development team needs more information on analysis, comparison of results and details of how the results were obtained. The test report is considered to be good if it's brief, descriptive and to the point. Now that we know the performance testing, the next important topic to discuss is the understanding of performance testing metrics. 
The first is processor usage, which refers to the amount of time the processor spends executing the non-idle threads. Second metric is memory usage. Memory use is the amount of physical memory available to the processor on a computer system. The third metric is disk time, which is the amount of time the disk is busy in executing read or write request. The fourth metric is the bandwidth that shows the bits per second used by a network interface. Moving forth, the next metric is the private bytes. It is the number of bytes a process has allocated that can be shared amongst the other processes. These are used to measure memory leaks and usage. Then comes the committed memory. This is the amount of virtual memory used. Then the next metric we have is the response time. It is the time between when the user enters a request to time to the first character of the response is received. Next metric is the throughput. It is the rate at which a computer or a network receives requests per second. Moving forth, the next metric is the hit ratios. The hit ratios are concerned with the number of SQL statements that are handled by cached data instead of expensive input-output operations. And the last metric in our list is the top weights. These are monitored to determine what wait times can be cut down to make the data retrieval faster from memory. Apart from this, some metrics like the rollback segment, garbage collection, thread counts, hits per second, CPU interruption per second, disk queue length, etc. Now when we know almost everything that is needed regarding performance testing, it is very important to know the tools that make performance testing possible. Here are the top 5 performance testing tools in the market today. The first tool we have is the load runner or HP load runner. As the name suggests, the load runner is great when it comes to handling a large amount of users for testing. The second tool in our list is Webload. Webload is one of the best testing tools for stress and load testing. The next tool in our list is Load UI. Load UI is a great testing tool to map the scalability and speed of the target product. The fourth tool in our list is NeoLoad. It is one of the fastest testing tools with a speed of around 10 times the traditional testing tools that are integrated seamlessly into our existing software with a wide array of tests. The last tool in our list is the Apache JMeter. Apache JMeter is one of the best and most used testing tools in the market right now. It is highly capable of creating a large number of virtual users working on web server. Moving forth, we shall talk about JMeter and understand why JMeter is preferred over all the other performance testing tools in the market. So moving forth, let's see what JMeter is. JMeter or Apache JMeter is an open source software that is 100% pure Java application. The application is designed to load or test functional behavior and measure performance. JMeter is originally designed for testing web applications but has since expanded to other test functions. To understand the concept of JMeter, let us assume that someday your team leads tell you to perform performance testing on some website like Facebook or Google.com for 100 users. What would be the first thing comes to your mind? Do you think it's practically possible to arrange 100 people with computers and access to internet and accessing the same website? Now, just imagine the infrastructure requirement when this testing has to be done for 10,000 users. This is when a need for software like JMeter arises. So what JMeter does is, it actually simulates. It will simulate the real user's behavior and perform load tests on server, group of servers, network or object. Now, let's have a look at some reasons why JMeter is used for load testing. We have divided these reasons into six parts. The first one is it's free of cost. Second one is performance testing of applications. Next one, platform independent. The fourth one is customizable. Fifth is recording and playback. And finally, sixth is the community support. Let's see all of these one after the other. The first reason we have is free of cost. One of the main deciding factors in any software is its cost. Normally, a software can range from high as six to seven figures per license. Here, JMeter is free of cost, very intuitive and has all the possibilities you need to automate your work. Then the second reason is performance testing of applications. The application is used to perform performance testing on different types of applications like web applications, web services, LDAP, database and shell scripts. JMeter can conduct load and performance tests for many different servers and server types. Web, HTTP and HTTPS, database via JDBC, LDAP and JMS. The third reason is platform independence. JMeter is written and developed using Java to run on any environment or workstation that accepts Java virtual machine, for example, Windows, Linux, Mac, etc. The next reason we have is that JMeter is customizable. Since JMeter is an open source application, it enables developers to customize whenever needed. JMeter has a comprehensive and user-friendly graphical user interface. 
Parameters are easy to define and understand scripting is simpler and clearer and adding and defining elements is more intuitive. Also, one screen shows everything you need, the script, the scenario and the analysis. These samplers are highly customizable when determining which request to be sent to the host. However, samplers don't enable full control of test actions. Moving forth, the following reason is recording and playback. The application provides record and playback options enabled with the drag and drop feature making the application faster and easier. The next and the last reason on our list is incredible community support. Jmeter is an open source tool with a brilliant community that keeps adding features and supports users who run into issues and problems. This ensures new users always have someone to answer their questions and long time users can improve their abilities on Jmeter. Also having an open source tool ensures that it keeps getting better and is always in line with users needs and requirements. Finally, let's have a look into the demo that shows the working of Jmeter. So the first step is, we shall go to the Apache JMeter folder. In that folder, go inside the bin folder and select the jmeter.bat file. Double click on this file, this might take a while, and then the jmeter window will open on the screen. The home window is divided into two sections. On the left side, all the test plan elements are added and on the right side, all the configurations of that element are added. As we are on the test plan element, we can see the configurations of the same. Here, the test plan is like a place or a container where all the elements we will be using to perform this test will be stored. All the requests, listeners and everything will be stored here. I have renamed this test plan as performance testing. Now the first step is to add thread group. Right click on the performance testing, go to add, then go to thread or users and select thread group. Let's name this as perform. Here. The thread group refers to the used or created users or needed to run this test. It has several different options like the action to be taken after there is an error. You can choose it the way you want. Then there is this number of threads where you can choose the number of users you want. Then there is a ramp up period in seconds option that states the time gap between the users hits. Third, there is a loop count where you can choose how many times the test will run for the number of users. You can also choose the test to run in finite times. There is also a scheduler here to help you schedule the start time and the test end time. Let's make the number of threads to be 2 and let's make the loop count to be 100. The next step is to add an HTTP request. For that, right click on the thread group, go to add option and go to the sampler option. In the menu that appears, select the HTTP request option. Here on the screen, there is a server name or IP box. We have to give the server name or the IP in that. Let's pick up a website and place the link in the box. We shall use the Simply Learns website here. Go to Simply Learns website and copy the URL from here. Then come back to the JMeter window and paste it onto the server name box. Keep in mind, we don't need to give the HTTP or HTTPS since these are protocols which will come in the other box and they will be automatically taken in the HTTP request case. Then in the path dialog box, we will leave the forward slash there since we have to access the root page and let's rename this HTTP request as simple. Now to get results, we shall add listeners. Listeners are something that are used to provide the outputs of a load test. There are different types of listeners present in JMeter and many may be added using plugins. We will use three different listeners here to have an idea about the representation that the JMeter provides. For that, right click on the thread group, then go to the add, select listener option and go to the view results in tree option. Then again, right click on the listener option and choose graph results. And for the third listener, again, right click and select the view results in the table option. Now it's time to run the test. For running the test, there are three simple ways. First, you can simply click on the green button here to run. Second is you can go to the run option and choose the run the test. And the third way 
you can right click on the first JMeter and choose to run. Let's simply choose the green button and run the test. First, we will have to save this JMeter test and then we shall go on to check the results of the test. Here in the view results tree, we can see the test being run. The same in the case of graph results, we can see the throughput option, then we can also see the time the test has been executing. Since we had put the threads to 2 and the loop count to 100, so the test will run for a while. We can check the view results in the table, we can see different performance testing metrics on the screen. You can see the thread name, label, sample, time per second, bytes, sort bytes and the latency. And in the tree option, when we click on the test, we can see a lot of information appearing on the screen. These are again several performance testing metrics. And in the graph results, we can see the graph coming up on the screen now, which represents the test taking place with respect to the IP address, thread and loop counts. So what JMeter exactly does is creates a request and sends it to the server. Once it receives the server's response, it collects them and visualizes those details in a chart or graph. After that, it processes the server's response and finally it generates the test results in several formats such as text, XML, JSON so that the tester can analyze the data. Let's get started with what is load testing. Load testing is a type of performance testing that determines an application's behavior when a large number of users access the application together. Here, performance testing is a software testing process used to test the speed, response time, stability and reliability of the software application under a particular workload. The testing determines a system's performance according to real-life conditions. To give you a better idea, let's say you have a printer. So you want to test a printer by transferring large number of documents for printing or test a mail server with thousands of concurrent users or to test a word processor by making a change in a large volume of data. This helps to know whether the existing infrastructure is capable of running the application or not. Load testing checks how much load can a system handle. The testing identifies the limitations due to hardware like CPU maximization, network bottleneck, memory limitation, etc. And it also identifies the issues in software configuration such as web server, application server, database server, etc. It helps to identify the maximum operating capability of an application and checks the performance of the application under different load conditions of system components and database components. Load testing is conducted to determine the number of concurrent users that an application can support without performance deterioration. The response time of each transaction of an application and the network delay between the client request and server response are also checked. Load testing proves itself very significant when it comes to determining user demands and satisfaction. Several tools make load testing possible, such as Apache JMeter, WebLoad, LoadUI, LoadRunner, Neo load, load ninja, etc. Here in this session, we shall be using JMeter for load testing. So JMeter or Apache JMeter is open source software that is 100% pure Java application. The application is designed to load or test functional behavior and measure performance. Performance testing means testing a web application against heavy load, multiple and concurrent user traffic. It was originally designed for testing web applications but has since expanded to other test functions. To simplify, let us assume that someday your team leads tell you to perform performance testing for some websites like yahoo.com or google.com for 100 users. What would be the first thing that comes to your mind? Do you think it's practically possible to arrange 100 people with 100 computers and access the internet and accessing the same website? Now just imagine the infrastructure requirement when this testing has to be done for 1000 or 10,000 users. This is when we need a software like JMeter. So what JMeter does is it simulates. It will simulate real user behaviors and perform load testing on a server, group of servers, network or object. Next, let's have a look at some reasons why JMeter is used for load testing. We have divided these reasons into six parts. It is free of cost, performance testing of applications, platform independent, customizable, recording and playback and community support. Now let's see all of these one after the other. The first one, free of cost. 
One of the main deciding factors in any software is its cost. Normally, a software can range from high as six to seven figures per license. Here, JMeter is free of cost, very intuitive, and has all the possibilities you need to automate your work. The next one is performance testing of applications. The application is used to perform performance testing on different applications like web applications, web servers, LDAP, database, and shell scripts. JMeter can conduct load and performance tests for many different server types like web, HTTP, and HTTPS, database via JDBC, LDAP, and JMS. The third important reason is its platform independent nature. JMeter is written and developed using Java programming language to run on any environment or workstation that accepts a Java virtual machine, for example, Windows, Linux, Mac, etc. The next reason we have is JMeter is highly customizable. Since JMeter is an open source application, it enables developers to customize it whenever needed. JMeter has a comprehensive and user-friendly graphical user interface. Parameters are easy to define and understand. Scripting is simpler and cleaner and adding and defining elements is more intuitive. Also, one screen shows you everything you need, the script, the scenario, and the analysis. The samplers are highly customizable when determining which request is to be sent to a host. However, samplers don't enable full control of test actions. Moving forth, the following reason is recording and playback. The application provides record and playback options enabled with the drag and drop features, making the application faster and easier. The next and the last reason in our list is incredible community support. JMeter is an open source tool with a brilliant community that keeps adding features and supports users who run into issues and problems. This ensures new users always have someone to answer their questions and long-time users can improve their abilities on JMeter. Also, having an open source tool ensures it keeps getting better and always in line with users' needs and requirements. Now, after we know about JMeter and the reasons to use JMeter, let's understand the process to perform load testing with a hands-on demo. The only thing that is kept in mind before this demo is we must have a fully functional JMeter on our system and by now we know that JMeter can be used in any operating system like Linux, Windows, Mac OS and Ubuntu. In this demo, we shall look into both graphical user and non-graphical user interface mode of load testing. So the first step is we shall go to the Apache JMeter folder. In that folder, go inside the bin folder and select the jmeter.bat file. Double click on this file, this might take a while, and then the jmeter window will open on the screen. The home window is divided into two sections. On the left side, the elements of the test plan are added, and on the right side, all the configurations of the element that are added. As we are on the test plan element, we can see the configurations of the scene. Here, the test plan is like a place or a container where all the elements we will use to perform this test will be stored. All the requests, the listeners and everything will be stored here. So the first step is to add listeners. For that, go to test plan, right click on the test plan, go to add, then go to threads, users and select a thread group. The test group refers to the users that are used or created or needed to run this test. It has several different options like the action to be taken after there is an error, you can choose it the way you want. Then there is this number of threads where you can choose the number of users you want. Then there is a ramp up period in seconds option that states the time gap between the user's hits. Then the third one, there is a loop count where you can choose how many times the test will run for the number of users. You can also choose the test to run infinite times. There is also a scheduler here to help you schedule the start time and the test end time. For now, let's leave everything to be only one. The next step is to add the HTTP request. For that, right click on the thread group and go to the option and go to the sampler option and go to the HTTP request option. Here on the screen, there is a server name or IP box. We have to give the server name or the IP in that. Let's pick a website and place the link in that box. We shall use the Simply Learns website here. Go to Simply Learns website and copy the URL from there. Now we have copied the Simply Learns URL. Now let's come back to the JMeter window and paste it in the server name box. Keep in mind that we don't need to give up the HTTP or HTTPS since these are protocols which will come in the other box and they will be automatically taken in the HTTP request case. So this is what I was talking about. 
Now let's rename this name as simply. Moving forth, let's create one more HTTP request. For that, again, right click on the thread group, select samplers and select HTTP request and go to simply learns website again. And there we have the resource link. Go to that link and copy the URL, then place that URL in the server or IP address box. We shall remove the HTTP from that link and add from the end, cut the resource part and paste it in the path box there. Here we will rename the HTTP request as resources. Moving forward to increase a load a little bit more, we shall use one more HTTP. So this time we shall add one more HTTP request. Again, right click on the threads group, go to the samplers option and select the HTTP request option again. To add one more link to the server and IP address, go to Simply Learn's website, go to the corporate training link. Now copy the URL and go back to the JMeter window and paste that URL in the IP box. Now cut the corporate training part from the link and paste it to the other path box. We shall again rename this HTTP request box as corporate. Now let's save this file. In the save dialog box, let's name it as load testing.jmx. Now to get the results, we shall add listeners. Listeners are something that is used to provide the outputs of the load test. There are different types of listeners present in JMeter and many may be added using plugins. The listener we will use here is the tree as it is comparatively easy to interpret. For that, right click on the thread group, then go to add select listener option and go for the view results in tree option. Now it's time to run the test and check the load. For running the test, there are three simple ways. First, you can simply click on the green button here to run. Second is you can go to the run option and choose the run test. And the third is the way you can right click on first JMeter and then choose run. Let's simply choose the green button and run the test. After we run the test, we shall go to the check the results of the test in the view results entry section. We can see the green symbol that states the test has successfully completed. Since we had left all the values to be one in the beginning, that's why there is just one test for each HTTP request. Now let's increase the load and let's change some numbers. Let's make the number of threads to be 10, ramp up the periods to be 2 and the loop count to be 10. Now let's run the test again with the green button. After running the test, we shall see the results in the tree and see the testing being performed. Since we have increased the number of users and ramp up the periods and the loop count, we can see the test being performed accordingly. Since the loop count now was 10 for each user, the test will run 10 times. So here on the screen, we can see the time taken and the number of tests being performed on the status of each hit onto the website. This is how you perform load testing in graphical user mode. Now perform the same test in non-graphical user mode. We shall remove the listener. So let's remove the view results in tree. After this, we will go to the command prompt. Then in the command prompt, we shall put the bin folder path in the Apache JMeter folder. Let's go to the bin folder and copy the location from here. Now paste the path in the command prompt and execute it. Once that is done, the next step is to put the command prompt for JMeter load testing. This command has got three parts. The first part is the hyphen N, hyphen T and hyphen L. Here the hyphen N represents the known graphical user interface mode. Hyphen T is used to specify the location of the test script. Hyphen L is used to specify the location of our output result. Now go to the location where our JMX file is stored. Let's search for the load testing.jmx file. Copy the path and paste it in the command prompt hyphen T. In the link, 
that we paste towards the end make sure that you add the name of the file with .gmx Now go back to the folder and make a .csv file, make an excel spreadsheet and rename it with .csv extension. Now copy this path and go back to the command prompt and paste it after the hyphen L. In the path, don't forget to add the name of the csv file towards the end. Then execute the command and wait for the command to end. After the command is successfully run, you can see that the tree is successfully created and towards the end of that execution, you can see that the message is the end of the run. Now you can go back to the folder and open the loadtesting.csv file. In that file, you can see the entire test result has been generated. This shows that the command has been successfully executed and the load testing is successful in the non-graphical mode without any errors. This is what we had in this demo. We saw the load testing in graphical user interface and non-graphical user interface mode. To have a better picture, we use dashboards. Dashboards include several graphs that explain the working of the website link. We use in the HTTP request, the dashboard generator is a modular extension of JMeter. Its default behavior is to read and process samples from a CSV file to generate HTML files. It generates the report and at the end of the load test or on demand. The dashboard reports provide metrics like the APDEX or Application Performance Index. The dashboard also provides a statistics table, response time over time, response times percentiles over time, active threads over time and response times in percentiles. We shall learn about dashboards and more in the forthcoming videos. In this video, we learned how critical is load testing in the software testing process and how it ensures high user satisfaction. A successful load testing will help to release high quality software. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Let's get started with what an API is. We often come across this term while reading any technical blog or magazine. An API or application programming interface is a programming code that enables data transmission between one software product and another. It is an intermediary software allowing two applications to communicate with each other. To understand API even better, let's take an example. For example, you are booking a flight. For that, you will begin with searching flights online concerning your destination, departure, return dates and many more filters. To make all these choices, you interact with the airline's website and access their database and see if there are any seats available on those dates and what the costs might be. While you're doing all this, from the time to begin to the time you finish booking your tickets, you're doing that with the help of an API. To simplify it even more, it can be said that whenever we use an application on our mobile phone, the application connects to the internet and sends data to the server. The server then retrieves the data, interprets it, performs necessary actions and sends it back to our phone. The application then interprets the data and presents the information we wanted in a readable way. This is what an API is. So that means each time we use an application like Facebook, send an instant image, check weather on our phone or make some specific choices while online shopping, we use an API. Now when we have a good idea about what an API is, let's look at another major thing before going on to the hands-on demo. That is why we use JMeter for API testing. Apache JMeter is an open source software and it is used to simulate loads of various scenarios and output performance data in several ways including CSV and XML files and graphs. We know that the Apache JMeter is 100% pure Java application. 
So, it is available on every OS that supports Java 6 or later. Some of the specific reasons what makes JMeter a perfect fit for API testing are JMeter enables fast API testing. It performs quick scope tests and enables load and stress testing. Then, as we know, it is an open source tool and supports load testing and stress testing. It has a lot of plugins and extensions. JMeter can be used across several platforms and can use various programming languages. Now, we know about API basics and why we use JMeter for its testing. It is the right time to see the process of API testing in JMeter. To download JMeter, you can go to the Apache JMeter website and download the file. To know the entire downloading process and installing JMeter, you can check our JMeter download and installation video in our JMeter playlist. Moving on, I have my JMeter installed. I will go to the Apache JMeter folder, go into the bin folder and open the batch file. This might take a while and then the JMeter window will open on the screen. The home window is divided into two sections. On the left side, all the elements of the test plan are added and on the right side, all the configurations of that element are added. As we are on the test plan element, we can see the configurations of the scene. Here, the test plan is like a place or a container where all the elements we will use to perform this test will be stored. All the requests listeners and everything will be stored here. So moving forward, right click on the first JMeter here and select the Add option. Then in this option, select the Threads option and then Threads group. The thread group refers to the users that are used or created or needed to run this test. It has several different options like the action to be taken after there is an error or you can choose it the way you want. Then, there is this number of threads where you can choose the number of users you want. Then, there is a ramp up period in seconds option that states the time gap between the user hits. Third, there is a loop count where you can choose how many times the test will run for the number of users. You can also choose the test to run in finite times. There is also a scheduler here to help you schedule the time for starting the test and the time for ending the test. For now, let's leave everything to be one only. Now, for some sample APIs, go to your browser and search for some sample REST API for testing. In this, we will go to the first link, that is, reqres.in or requestresponse.in. We will create and run get, post, put and delete REST API request in JMeter in the demo. Here in this link, we have all get, post, put, delete APIs. So we shall choose the first link here, list users. Here we have the link request. Open this link in the new tab. Then we have got the URL for this API. Copy this URL and go to the JMeter window. Then in the JMeter window, right click thread group and go to add. In the box that appears, select samplers. You can see all types of requests that JMeter can work on. We shall choose the HTTP request. Here, you will have to give the address to some home pages or websites. Here, in the server name or IP box, we have to give the server name or the IP. So here, we shall paste the get API request URL. In the protocol box, we shall put the HTTPS. If in the URL, the protocol would have been HTTP, then we would have left this box empty. In the URL, we shall put the URL link. 
Remember that we do not put any slashes here and that anything after the URL would be put in the path. So we shall remove the path from the URL and put it in the path box. Then we shall take part from the question mark and use it to give parameters. Since it is the get API, we will have to give parameters. We will add the name in the parameters and give the name as page and value as 2. In this HTTP request drop down, we can see all the different types of HTTP requests that JMeter accepts. For now, we shall leave it to be get since we are using the get API. And also, let's name this HTTP request as get API. Now, when our HTTP request is ready, we shall perform the test on it. To determine what the results of the test will be, we need to add some more test elements. We shall again right click on the thread group, go to the listener options, then in the box we can check the different types of reports that JMeter provides us. For now, we shall select two of these. Let's choose view results tree and the view results in the table. Now save the test. I will save the test with the name API testing. And finally, let's run it. For running the test, there are three simple ways. First, you can simply click the green button on the run. Second, you can go to this run option and choose to run the test. And the third way is you can right click on the first JMeter and choose to run. Let's simply choose the green button and run the test. After we run the test, we shall go to check the result of the test. Let's go to the view results tree. Here, we can see the green status that shows the test was successful. And the view results in a table. We can see again the status is green. Since we had put the number of threads and loop to be 1, there is just one entry in both the results. Now, let's try one more thing. We shall go to the thread group and change the number of threads to be 10 and run the test again. After running the test, we shall see the results in the table and see the testing being performed. And same happens in the case of view results in table. Now in the view results tree, we can click on a request and see different information. Here, we can see the sample start, load time, latency error, etc. Same in the view results in table. You can see all such information in a tabular format. You can also see the response data here. This is the same data as it was there when we copied the URL from the browser. You can furthermore check the response headers and the request that was placed. Now we are done with the get API request. Let's add the second request that is the post request. Again. Add a HTTP request by going to the sampler in the thread group. Then come back to the browser window and click on the post API option. Then open the request URL in the new window. Then go to this window, copy the URL and come back to the JMeter window. First, let's rename this HTTP request as post API. Then let's paste the URL in the server name or IP box. Again, let's put HTTP in the protocol box. Address in the server or IP address box and path in the path box. And in this HTTP request drop down, select the post option this time. Then let's go to the parameter part. Here, select the body data option and we shall have to add body now. So, go back to the browser window and copy the body from here. Come back to the JMeter window and paste the body here. Here, you can check some advanced settings also in case you need them. For now, since this is just a demo, we shall keep it really simple. 
So let's run this. We shall go to our two listeners and clear the previous output. Then we shall save the test and run it. Now you can see the two tests are here. Since the thread count is 1, let's make the thread count to be 10 again. Let's see what happens. Now when I run the test, I can see the test running a required number of times, that is 20 times. Again, I can see information about different requests that include different parameters like latency, errors, etc. Now, let's move on to our third API request, that is the put request. Go back to the browser and click on put request. Open the request in the new tab. Copy the URL and come back to the JMeter window. Make a new HTTP request by going to the sampler in the thread group. First, let's rename this HTTP request as put API. Then, let's paste the URL in the server name or IP box. Again, let's put HTTP in the protocol box. Address the server or IP address box and path in the path box. And in the HTTP request dropdown, select the put option this time. Here also we shall have to add body data. So go back to the browser window and copy the body from here. Coming back to JMeter window, select the body data option and we shall have to add body now and paste the body here. We shall go to our two listeners and clear the previous output. Make the thread count to be 1 and then we shall save the test and run it. Now you can see the three tests here. Since the thread count is 1, here by clicking on the API request, we can check a lot of data like the response, body and response headers. And same in the case of view results in the table. You can see the data in a tabular format. Let's make the thread count to be 10 and again see what happens. Now when I run the test, I can see the test running a required number of times. And here, I can see information about different requests. Now, let us add our last API request, that is the delete request. Go back to the browser and click on the delete request. Open the request in the new tab, copy the URL and come back to the JMeter window. Make a new HTTP request by going to the sampler in the thread group. First, let's rename this HTTP request as delete API. Then, let's paste the URL in the server name or IP box. Again, let's put HTTP in the protocol box, address in the server or IP address box and path in the path box. And in this HTTP request dropdown, select the delete option this time. Here, there is nothing to be added in the parameters section. So, let's go to the two listeners and clear what all is there. Then save this test and run it. Since we did not make the number of threads 1 this time, we can see the test running n number of times. We can see the information of any API request by just clicking on it. Let's get started with what is script recording. Record testing in JMeter helps testers to record and run their activity against test targets. It is a type of automated testing.
but for multiple users the test script is designed to record such scenarios the proxy server allows jmeta to watch and record user activity while browsing web applications with a normal web browser when we talk about proxy it is a component that is present between you and the remote server let us say that you want to record web browser interactions when jmeta starts acting like a proxy this is when jmeta script recording is used script recording is one of the advanced and impressive ways to figure out and eliminate the complexity of browser interactions in software testing now when we know what script recording is and how it is relevant let's look into how to do it in jmeta but before that let's check the prerequisites of script recording in jmeta there are three major prerequisites first is having jmeta installed in your system the second requirement is having java installed in your system the third and final requirement is having mozilla firefox in your system now let us have a look at the hands on demo of how to perform script recording in jmeter so the first step is we shall go to the apache jmeter folder in that folder we will go into bin folder and then select the jmeter.bat folder let us double click on that this might take a while and then the jmeter window will open on the screen the home window is divided into two sections on the left side all the test plan elements are added and on the right side all the configurations of the elements are added as we are on the test plan element we can see the configurations of the same here you can think of the test plan like a place or a container where all the elements we will be using to perform this test will be stored all the requests all the listeners and everything will be stored here now the first step is to add thread group so for that right click on the thread group select add and from add go to threads or users and in that select thread group here the thread group refers to the users it has several different options like the action to be taken after there is an error you can choose it the way you want then there is this number of threads where you can choose the number of users you want then there is a ramp up period and second option that states the time gap between the user hits third there is a loop count where you can choose how many number of times the test will run for a number of users you can also choose the test to run for infinite times there is also a scheduler here to help you schedule the start time and the test end time the next step is to add an http request for that right click on the thread group go to the add option and now go to the sampler option select the http request option here there is a server name or ip box we have to give the server name or ip in that let us pick a website and place the link in the box we shall use the simply learns website here go to simply learns website and copy the url from here then come back to the jmeter window and paste it in the server name box keep in mind that we don't need to give http or https since these are protocols that will come in the other box and they will be automatically taken in the http request case then in the path dialog box we will leave a forward slash there since we have to access the root page now the next step is to add the http test script recorder for that right click on the test plan then go to non test elements and select the http test script recorder option the window on the screen shows several options here we can see the start option to begin the test then there is a box that has the port number you can make this number whatever you like i'll put this number as 1234 for now then let's go back to the simply learns website and go to the resources page then come back to the jmeters window and rename the recording controller as resources now let us add another recording controller so that jmeter works like a proxy with the help of https test script recorder then again go back to the resources page that we just opened and scroll down a little bit here we can see several technologies and several other links in those links you can select any one of the links i will select digital marketing here then go back to the jmeter window and rename the recording controller as digital marketing then finally let's add a recording controller for the home page and rename it as simply learns home page so now we can see that we have a thread group here then there is a http request where we have simply learn website in the server name then there are three recording controllers one for the resources the second for digital marketing and a third one for home page and last we have a http test script recorder here i will rearrange the recording controllers in sequence putting the simply learns home page controller on the top and then placing the resources finally digital marketing recording controller 
Now, let us open Mozilla Firefox in our system. Go to the general option here and scroll down to the network settings. In the network settings option, select settings. In the window that appears, select the manual proxy configuration. Here, we shall put the port number. For now, I will put the port number as 1234 in this box. Here in the HTTP proxy, we have localhost and we have selected to use this proxy for FTP and HTTPS and then click on OK. Now, go back to the Apache JMeter folder and now we shall use this Apache JMeter temporary root CA file which is a security certificate file. So coming back to the Mozilla Firefox window, go to the options tab and in this tab, I will type certificates and here we shall select view certificates. In the window that opens, let us import the security certificate from JMeter folder. Here, we shall select these two boxes so that the proxy server can access the website that we shall enter here in the browser and then select OK. Coming back to the JMeter window, let us add some listeners to get the results. Listeners are something that are used to provide the outputs of a test. There are different types of listeners present in JMeter and many may be added using plugins. For adding listeners, right click on HTTP test script recorder. For adding listeners, right click on the HTTP test script recorder. Then go to add option and then go to listeners option and then add view results tree. Now let us add one more listener in the same way. We shall add view results in tree. Now in the HTTP test script recorder in the target controller option, save the target controller. Here in the drop down, select the simply learn homepage option as we will begin the script recording for the homepage. Finally, let's start the test by clicking here. Click on OK. Now, go back to the Mozilla browser and here, let us open the Simply Learn's homepage. Now, come back to the JMeter window. Go to the homepage recording controller. You can see the homepage controller has started. As you can see, the homepage controller has started recording the scripts that are being performed. These are the tasks that are performed on the client side to the server side. Now, we can check both the listeners that we have put to see what all functions are working fine and what all are not. All the tasks from the time that we have entered to simplylearn.com in our browser are recorded in this homepage controller. To take the test further, go to the test script recorder and stop the test. Now here in the target controller, select the second controller that is the resources controller. Now start the test again. Select OK. Go to Simply Learn's website, select resources. After opening the resources link, go back to the JMeter window. And now in the resources controller, you can see what all events are recorded from the client side to the server side. Once we click on the resources link, now again in the two listeners, you can check all the scripts and tests are successful or have failed. Now for our last recording controller, go back to the test script recorder and stop the test. Now here in the target controller, select the third option that is the digital marketing. Now here in the target controller, select the third option that is digital marketing. Start the test and select OK. Now get back to the Mozilla Firefox window, go to resources, go to digital marketing. After digital marketing link has opened, go back to the JMeter window. And now in the digital marketing controller, you can see what all events are recorded from the client side to the server side. Once we click on that link, I guess this is taking a while. You can see all steps coming under the recording controller and then you can also see the two listeners, some of the tests are being successful and some are not. We can sum this entire process as a way of communicating between the server and the client with a proxy server help. In this case, the proxy server is our JMeter. That is why it was able to record all the steps that are happening while we were performing any task. This is how we can perform the JMeter script testing in few simple steps. Now, when you are done with the proxy server, do not forget to go back to your browser and change your network settings back to normal. That is, go to these settings, select use system proxy settings and that's how it is done. With that, we have come to an end of this session on DevOps testing tutorial. Should you have any queries regarding any of the topics covered in this session or should you feel that you need the resources used in this session like the PPT, code demonstration or projects, then feel free to let us know in the comment section below and our team of experts will be more than happy to resolve all your queries at the earliest. Until next time, thank you, stay safe and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.